Uh, we are honored to have two distinguished speakers uh, participating in our second panel today, neither of which is me. I'm Jeremy Coons. I teach philosophy here at Georgetown University in Qatar, but enough about me. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. John Keown. He holds law and doctoral degrees from the United Kingdom. Uh, he taught in the law and ethics uh, of medicine. He taught law and ethics of medicine in the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge before coming to the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University where he holds the Rose F. Kennedy Chair in Christian Ethics. He has written seven books and a number of articles, mainly on law and ethics at the beginning and end of life. His most recent book, Euthanasia, Ethics, and Public Policy, Policy was published in October by Cambridge University Press. Uh, our second speaker, shall I go ahead and I'll just introduce both speakers at the same time. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Uh, Kartina Chung. She holds both law and doctoral degrees from the UK as well. She has lectured around the world on the topic of medical law, and she currently teaches medical law and ethics at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK. She has published widely on the topics of end of life issues, religiously sensitive health care, professional liability, uh, medical mediation, consent, and confidentiality. Uh, both of our speakers, in addition to their philosophical and theological studies, have, as I noted, extensive legal training, and both have been admitted as barristers uh, to the courts of England and Wales. Uh, thus, I cannot think of two more qualified people to talk on uh, today's topic, regulating palliative care, legal questions, and governing frameworks. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kion as our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here to be with you today. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Georgetown campus in Doha. Um, now, I only have one um, slide, uh, uh, so I'm going to scroll down as the various points I want to make come into view. Um, and I think I'll just begin by outlining my talk to make it quite clear what you may expect. Uh, I've basically got four points to make. Um, the first point is there are massive global need, especially in poorer countries, for palliative care. Second point is that there is an ethical duty on the global community, especially wealthier countries, to meet that need, which could be met at little cost. Point three, there may well be, depending on the jurisdiction, a legal duty on physicians and on healthcare institutions to provide reasonable palliative care. Fourth, a failure to provide palliative care may also constitute a breach of human rights. So those are my four uh, key points, and we'll take them uh, one by one. Um, as you'll see, and we've heard already from one or two speakers, evidence of the obvious and urgent global need to provide palliative care. There is a massive global shortfall in the provision of adequate palliative care. So one study which I quote, this is from the Lancet Commission, which was mentioned by Dan Shemezi. Um, more than 61 million people per year, including 5 million children, are affected by serious health-related suffering, of whom 80% live in low- and middle-income countries. Alleviating this suffering, said another source, is a global health and equity imperative. And the cost? The cost of alleviating this suffering is an estimated 145 million dollars per year, the annual budget of one medium-sized hospital in the USA. Those statistics, it seems to me, are quite damning. This massive unmet global need, which could really be relatively easily met by the global community. So I'm going to argue that um, there is an ethical duty to meet this need, and also that there may be a legal duty on physicians and hospitals to do so as well, uh, as well as there perhaps being a, a human right to receive adequate palliative care. So this denial is a gross breach of the human rights of millions of people around the world. Now, I was going to begin by defining palliative care, but that's been done several times um, already. 
Um, I'll just make perhaps one point about the World Health Organization's definition of palliative care. Um, the point I want to pull out is that it observes that palliative care provides relief from pain and other distressing symptoms, so not only pain, affirms life and regards dying as a normal process, and neither intends to hasten or postpone death. So this is a very important, it seems to me, feature of palliative care, and which distinguishes it from euthanasia. For euthanasia involves the intentional shortening of life. Palliative care does not. It neither intends to hasten nor postpone death. So the question I'm going to be addressing today is, uh, it relates to the unreasonable failure to alleviate severe pain in the terminally ill. That's the particular instance I'll be looking at, but the implications of what I've got to say uh, apply to palliative care more broadly understood to include the alleviation of symptoms other than pain and in patients who are not terminally ill. If there's an ethical and legal duty to alleviate severe pain in the terminally ill, then it's difficult to see why it should not apply to the alleviation of pain in the non-terminally ill and to the relief of other serious symptoms. A little more on the uh, need for palliative care. Um, well, the growth of palliative care over the last half century has been one of the most inspirational movements in modern medicine. The founding in 1967 of St. Christopher's Hospice in London by Dr. Later Dame Cicely Saunders was a landmark in the development of the hospice movement. A House of Lords Select Committee that reported in 1994, the Select Committee on Medical Ethics, it was a committee that was essentially concerned with whether we should legalize euthanasia, and it recommended unanimously that we should not. Noted that thanks to the increasing dissemination of best practice by means of home care teams and training for general practitioners, palliative care was becoming more widely available in hospitals and in the community. However, it said, much remained to be done. It concluded, quote, with the necessary political will, such care could be made available to all who could benefit from it. We strongly commend the development and growth of palliative care services. And I think it's important to link here the importance of developing palliative care in the context of uh, um, a developing world in which there is much pressure for the legalization of euthanasia. If this growing need is not met by the advancement of palliative care, then the case for euthanasia will be regarded as all the stronger. Untreated pain and symptoms are probably the best recruiting sergeant for the euthanasia movement. The same year as the Walton Committee reported in 1994, the New York State Task Force observed that many healthcare professionals lack the clinical knowledge and experience needed to provide effective palliative care. Educators, the task force said, must convey to nursing and medical students that pain and symptom management are a basic and essential component of medical care for professionals in all areas of medical practice. Continuing education for healthcare professionals, it said, was also vital. It added hospitals and other healthcare facilities had the responsibility to promote high quality medical care, which should encompass the delivery of adequate pain and symptom management. Doctors and nurses should be trained to ask patients about their pain on a regular basis. And hospitals and nursing facilities should address palliative care in their quality assurance procedures. American Pain Society also urged the improvement of training. Good palliative care, it said, should be made standard, not exceptional treatment for all patients. In 2010, in a survey of end-of-life care in 40 countries, the United Kingdom was ranked first and the United States third. But there is evidence that even in the United Kingdom, many people still suffer unnecessarily as a result of the lack of good palliative care. 
2011, the palliative care funding review estimated that around 92,000 and perhaps as many as 140,000 people had unmet palliative care needs each year. It noted changing demographics with an aging population, longer chronic disease trajectories, and greater comorbidity provide further incentives to improve and expand palliative care services. And the lack of palliative care, as we've noted already, is even graver in poorer countries. And of course, countries like the UK are very wealthy. A survey by Human Rights Watch in 2011 concluded, every year, tens of millions of people around the world with life-threatening illnesses suffer unnecessarily from severe pain and other debilitating symptoms because they lack access to palliative care. Experts, he said, estimated that 60% of those who die each year in the developing world, a staggering 33 million people, need palliative care. Well then, what is our ethical duty in the light of this dreadful access abyss that the statistics disclose? Well, it seems to me there is an obvious ethical duty on the global <clears throat> community, especially wealthier countries, to meet the need, and a need that could be met at little cost. And I'm just going to suggest um, that this is actually one of those perhaps few areas in bioethics in which there actually is a very, very broad consensus about what the moral way forward ought to be. Let's take a simple case. Uh, a simple hypothetical. Betty is 75 and she lives in London. Six months ago, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer of the colon, which has metastasized. As Betty's life reaches its end, she is admitted to her local hospital under the care of Dr. Andrews, a consultant geriatrician. The cancer is causing her considerable pain. But Dr. Andrews fails to bring her pain under control, though he could easily have done so by prescribing morphine or by calling in a palliative care specialist to attend her. Betty lingers on in agony. Has Dr. Andrews acted ethically? Well, sadly, the case of Betty is far from rare, as we've seen, even in a developed country, uh, like the UK, which is rated often first in end-of-life care. There are thousands of people with an unmet palliative care need. Well, the following have been traditionally understood as the goals of medicine. The maintenance of health, cure or healing, and where cure is not possible, helping patients approximate as far as possible to organic well-functioning, and symptom control. So that the symptoms of an organic disorder, such as pain, are kept from unnecessarily obtruding on a patient's capacity to enjoy some of the other goods of life. So, symptom control, pain control, is a recognized goal and an important goal of medicine. A physician who does not attend to the control of a patient's symptoms ignores a key principle of Hippocratic ethics to benefit the patient. The doctor ignores one of the key goals of medicine, the treatment and alleviation of symptoms. And pain is an all too common symptom which can have serious physical, psychological and social effects as we've heard this morning. That physicians are under at least a prima facie duty to palliate pain is a proposition which would surely attract the support not only of those in the Hippocratic medical tradition but those from other ethical traditions as well such as utilitarianism and principalism. The utilitarian, whether one who is concerned to maximize pleasure and minimize pain, or to maximize patients' preferences, would surely endorse the duty to alleviate a patient's suffering. So too would someone who adopted a principalist approach to ethics, an approach developed, of course, by uh, to former members of the Kennedy Institutes of Ethics, Tom Beecham 
and Jim Childress and developed in, in their famous book, Principles of Biomedical Ethics. They advocate respect for autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. To fail to provide patients with the pain relief they need and want could be said to offend all four of these principles. So it seems to me that the ethical proposition that hospitals and doctors have a duty to provide adequate pain relief to their patients, at least where they have the resources to do so, seems to be a proposition which would attract a very broad ethical consensus from people from a range of different ethical traditions. There would certainly appear to be such a duty in wealthy developed nations like the United Kingdom and the United States. I want to move now from that argument that there is a, a clear, it seems to me, ethical duty to meet that access abyss. In fact, uh, I quote another source there, it's shocking that the global health community has not seized the opportunity and responded to the ethical imperative to close the access abyss in the relief of pain and other types of suffering, both at the end of life and across the course. What does this say about our values as a global society? I think it's incontrovertible that there's a, an important, urgent ethical duty around the world, given that we can so easily do it at relatively little cost, given the political will. Um, I'm going to turn now to the argument that um, there may also be a legal duty to uh, alleviate the pain of patients. Um, I won't say a great deal about this. Uh, I'll just give you an outline why I think there is uh, a legal duty, and I'll be referring at least to uh, English law, and as you may know, English law um, has been hugely influential globally, so many of the major countries in the world, such as the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, a number of countries in Africa, former parts of the British Empire, uh, inherited our common law legal system, law developed historically by judicial decisions. Um, so I'll be confining myself to common law jurisdictions, but I've no reason to believe the answer to this would be any different in systems based on other systems of law, such as continental European countries, which are historically based on, on a Roman law tradition. Um, let's go back to Betty. You remember we left Betty suffering because Dr. Andrews failed to attend to her severe pain as she's dying from cancer. Well, it seems to me a patient like Betty uh, would have a very good action in negligence against Dr. Andrews and against the hospital in which she was being treated. Um, firstly, um, Hospitals, employers are liable for the negligence of their employees carried out in the course of their employment. It's called vicarious liability. So I think Betty and patients like her could contemplate bringing an action in negligence against the hospital on the basis of its vicarious liability for the negligence of its employee, Dr. Andrews. Now, what would she have to prove in order to recover damages from the hospital? Well, she'd have to prove on a balance of probabilities a breach of Dr. Andrews' duty of care toward her, which caused her loss. Now, there'd be no difficulty showing that Dr. Andrews owed her a duty of care. She is, after all, Dr. Andrews' patient. Could she prove that Dr. Andrews was in breach of his duty of care? Well, the test in English law is whether the doctor satisfied the Bolam test, as it's called, after an earlier case. Did Dr. Andrews act in accordance with a practice accepted as proper by a responsible body of medical practitioners? This will involve a consideration of the facts of the case in the light of the medical evidence and a professional medical opinion. Depending on the facts and that opinion, it may well be possible to establish that Dr. Andrews fell below the required standard of care. If, for example, he was, or should have been, aware of Betty's serious pain, 
And if he could easily have taken steps to alleviate it, as by prescribing morphine and appropriate dosages, then it's difficult to see why he would not be in breach of duty to Betty. <laughs> How can it be in accordance with responsible medical practice to allow one's patient to suffer serious pain which could easily be alleviated? If Dr. Andrews were to reply that other doctors would also fail to take steps to alleviate Betty's pain, perhaps because doctors are insufficiently knowledgeable about pain relief, it's doubtful that this would be sufficient to show that he had acted reasonably. First, Perhaps he should have had sufficient knowledge about pain relief, particularly if the knowledge he lacked was basic, or if he could easily have accessed the required information. Secondly, even if he was not unreasonably ignorant of palliative care, and the case called for more expert knowledge, perhaps he should have consulted with or called in an expert in palliative care. Although evidence of medical opinion is important in determining what constitutes medical negligence, the courts may find conduct negligent even if it is endorsed by a body of professional opinion. So in one leading case, for example, a judge said, in cases of diagnosis and treatment, there are cases where, despite a body of professional opinion sanctioning the defendant's conduct, the defendant can properly be held liable for negligence. In my judgment, said the judge, this is because in some cases it cannot be demonstrated to the judge's satisfaction that the body of opinion relied upon is reasonable or responsible. Generally, the courts attach great weight to professional medical opinion and practice, but they are not bound by it. Cases like Betty's where the benefits of palliative care are high and the risks, if any, are low, it's not easy to see how Dr. Andrews' failure to alleviate her pain could be regarded as at all reasonable or responsible. And as for proving that Dr. Andrews' breach of duty caused her loss, if Betty can prove that but for Dr. Andrews' failure to treat her pain or to call in an expert in palliative care who would have done so, um, she would not have suffered serious pain, then she will have satisfied this causation of establishing, uh, the requirement of establishing causation. And uh, pain and suffering, the kind of pain and suffering Betty has suffered, is a recognized head of damages. So it seems to me, in Betty's case, and Betty's case I don't think is rare, uh, there is a fairly clear case against the hospital, as well as Dr. Andrews personally, uh, for acting negligently. Now, if for any reason uh, one cannot establish negligence against Dr. Andrews, it may also be possible to bring an action against the hospital on the basis that it has breached its direct duty to Betty to ensure she has uh, tr been treated with reasonable care. Um, it may be, for example, that Dr. Andrews says, well, I was just, uh, there, there was inadequate staffing in the hospital and I was asked to attend to too many patients. That's why Betty suffered. It's not really my fault. Well, in that case, uh, Betty can sue the hospital directly and argue, well, it was the hospital's duty to ensure I got reasonable care. It didn't do so because it provided inadequate staffing. And for that reason, the hospital's liable, even if Dr. Andrews himself uh, might not be. And I, it's doubtful that a hospital could simply say in response, well, resources are tight. <coughs> Courts are understandably reluctant to second-guess resource allocation decisions, but it doesn't follow that they would hold a failure to provide reasonable palliative care services, at least where those services are of proven effectiveness in meeting what is, after all, a basic need, uh, the palliation of serious pain, and are not particularly costly. Human Rights Watch report I mentioned earlier states that most suffering caused by pain is avoidable as medicines to treat it are effective, safe, inexpensive, and generally easy to administer. And that with relatively inexpensive interventions, palliative care can treat common symptoms of life-threatening illness, including breathlessness, nausea, anxiety, and depression. So it seems to me, in short, that in a case like Betty's, Dr. Andrews uh, and the hospital may be liable to Betty in negligence. Um, 
I'll now just touch on another possible area of law which may be relevant, which is uh, criminal liability. So I've concluded there is possible liability for negligence in the civil law, which could result in uh, a board of damages to Betty. But there is also, it seems to me, possible liability in criminal law. <clears throat> um, firstly, uh, touching on something that was said this morning, um, I think it's important to stress that <clears throat> doctors have nothing to fear from the criminal law when they administer palliative care reasonably, even if their actions incidentally produce side effects such as a shortening of life. I know a number of doctors uh, think that the law does prohibit them from acting in such circumstances, but this is a, a complete misunderstanding of the criminal law. As we also heard earlier, the evidence from palliative care experts is that properly administered uh, analgesics, including opioids, do not in fact shorten life. Uh, one expert I quoted in one of my earlier books referred to this belief as a persistent fantasy that, that analgesics do shorten life as a side effect. Any fear that some doctors may have of prosecution for the reasonable use of palliative drugs is entirely misplaced. The courts, this is the case in England, and I would take it it's the case in all common law jurisdictions, the courts have long made it clear that a doctor is entitled to administer palliative treatment in order to ease pain and suffering, even if, as an unintended side effect, the treatment shortens life. The law, in other words, embraces the principle of double effect that Dr. Donovan mentioned this morning. The important distinction between, on the one hand, aiming to bring about a shortening of life, which would be lawful, and aiming to ease pain, merely foreseeing shortening of life as a side effect, which is both ethical and lawful. So to quote one eminent judge, in a leading case, he noted the established rule that a doctor may, when caring for a patient who is, for example, dying of cancer, lawfully administer painkilling drugs, despite the fact that he knows that an incidental effect of that application will be to abbreviate the patient's life. Indeed, in one case, which involved the prosecution of a doctor for the attempted murder of his patient by injecting her with potassium chloride, there's no question doctor's intent was actually to kill his patient, the judge in his trial directed the jury that not only were doctors uh, entitled to administer palliative drugs with intent to ease pain, even if they foresaw hastening of death as a side effect, but that they were under a duty to administer palliative drugs to ease pain. He said, there can be no doubt that the use of drugs to reduce pain and suffering will often be fully justified, notwithstanding that it will hasten the moment of death. What can never be lawful is the use of drugs with the primary purpose of hastening the moment of death. He went on, it was plainly the doctor's duty to do all that was medically possible to alleviate his patient's pain and suffering, even if that course adopted carried with it an obvious risk that as a side effect, her death would be rendered likely or even certain. Therefore, in English law, a doctor not only may but must try to palliate his or her patient's suffering. So the law is not in opposition to good palliative care, it is a friend of good palliative care. And I will just mention, um, should a doctor neglect to provide adequate palliative care, there are indeed a number of pieces of legislation that may result in the doctor's prosecution for the offence of willful neglect of the patient. So indeed, the criminal law, far from being a foe of good palliative care, is a friend of good palliative care. And doctors who do not practice good palliative care and neglect their patients, leaving them in unreasonable pain or suffering, may at least in certain circumstances find themselves charged with this crime of willful neglect. Unfortunately, this crime only applies to certain groups of patients, and it seems to me 
that there is a good case for um, uh, legislative reform to ensure that doctors who neglect any patient, even those falling outside these particular groups, uh, faces criminal liability for their willful neglect to treat the patient's pain or perhaps um, other symptoms. So it seems to me that there is a good case for Parliament to legislate, not only in England but in other jurisdictions, and we're going to hear my colleague in the next talk uh, tell us a little about some legislative initiatives in other jurisdictions. Um, there are several legislative approaches which one can adopt. One could legislate to enact a specific duty to provide pain relief. That's one. Alternatively, legislation could criminalise causing a patient unnecessary suffering. And there is actually a precedent for this in English law. We do have a statute, a very old statute, which has been updated over many years, which uh, makes it an offence for a person to allow an animal in his or her care to experience unnecessary suffering. So one question we have to ask is, if it is a crime for a person to allow his or her dog to suffer unnecessarily, why is it not a crime for a doctor to allow his or her patient to suffer unnecessarily? So there is another approach. A third would be to take the existing crime of willful neglect, which applies to limited groups of patients, and apply it uh, more generally. Um, and one could extend it not only to the treatment of pain and symptoms, but also it would apply to a neglect of patients' basic care. As you may know, although uh, in England we are generally very proud of uh, the state of medical care, there have been a number of very, very serious lapses in uh, a number of cases resulting in the gross neglect of patients. One particular hospital, there was appalling neglect of patients and it led to a senior lawyer being appointed, appointed to investigate and report. And his report said the evidence gathered by the inquiry shows that for many patients, the most basic elements of care were neglected. Calls for help to use the bathroom were ignored and patients were left lying in soil sheeting and sitting on commodes for hours, often feeling ashamed and afraid. Patients were left unwashed at times for up to a month. Food and drinks were left out of the reach of patients, and many were forced to rely on family members for help with feeding. Staff failed to make basic observations, and pain relief was provided late, or in some cases not at all. Patients were too often discharged before it was appropriate, only to have to be readmitted shortly afterwards. The standards of hygiene were at times awful, with families forced to remove used bandages and dressings from public areas and to clean toilets themselves for fear of catching infections. So it seems to me that not only is there a good case that uh, doctors and hospitals may be answerable to the civil law for negligence, but also that even under the existing law, there can be possible criminal liability, at least for the doctors, um, and that there's a good case for um, considering maybe a more comprehensive statute to make it clear that it's a crime to willfully neglect patients by failing to provide adequate palliative care or by simply neglecting the basic needs of patients generally. That's my third point. The law can help here to drive improvements in palliative care. And I think those possibilities should be explored. There's a good case for legislation that would impose a clear duty on physicians and healthcare institutions to provide reasonable palliative care all who could benefit from it. And briefly and finally, um, another driver of improvement in palliative care nationally and internationally could be the recognition of a human right to um, palliative care. Now this is a little more, uh, I think, perhaps less well-established than um, the civil 
and criminal law I'd be referring to, but a number of scholars have argued that there is indeed a basic human right to palliative care. And I will just mention uh, briefly uh, one or two um, passages from the work of these scholars uh, in that respect. Um, so one author, for example, has written, there's an international consensus emerging that unreasonable failure to treat pain is poor medicine, unethical practice, and an abrogation of a fundamental human right. Others have noted that Article 12.1 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights provides that the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health and General Comment 14, issued by the committee that oversees that covenant, asserted that in particular states are under an obligation to respect the right to health by inter alia refraining from denying or limiting equal access for all persons to preventive, curative and palliative health services. Also, a statement made to the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2008 by the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health that every year millions suffered horrific, avoidable pain and that palliative care needed urgent and greater attention. And there's a statement by the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health and the Special Rapporteur on Torture that international human rights law required governments to provide essential medicines, including opioid analgesics, as part of their minimum core obligations under the Right <laughs> to Health and that lack of access to essential medicines, including for pain relief, was a global human rights issue, which should be a right to adequate palliative care. So in summary then, we have those four key points. There is a massive global need, especially in poorer countries, for palliative care, an obvious ethical duty on the global community, especially wealthy countries, to meet that need, which could be met at little cost, there may also be civil and criminal liability for failure to ensure adequate palliative care. And finally, failure to do so may also be a breach of human rights. Thank you. This paper continues the theme that was pursued in Professor Kieran's presentation. It puts forward the proposition that the law can indeed be a powerful instrument in safeguarding the uh, interests of those in need of palliative care. For this, the people will firstly look at the experiences of a number of countries that have legislated on palliative care. In particular, we'll examine some of the themes that they have deemed important for legal oversight. Based on this, it will reflect on the advantages of having a regulatory framework before illustrating its significance through a case study of a Muslim majority country, Malaysia. Worldwide, there does not seem to be many countries that have legislated on this issue. And the next uh, slide shows some of those that have. Of this, palliative care is either infused within the country's general health law, or that they have a specific legislation dealing with the for England and New Zealand, those specific laws are currently still in the process of being passed. New Zealand's experience is an interesting one, as palliative care is currently embedded within their general um, health laws. But their access to end-of-life palliative care bill aims to further ensure that all New, New Zealanders get access to high-quality service, even if they live in remote or isolated areas of the country. The issues which these countries focus on in their laws, it differs one from another. But the one theme that feature in all is that anyone in need of palliative care should be able to access it promptly in a setting that is consistent with their needs and preferences. This is irrespective of where they live in the country. Documented cases from Mexico, for example, shows that before their laws um, was passed, some cancer patients had to travel up, uh, for up to half a day on public transport to access services in urban hospitals. As for those who were hindered from traveling by poverty or extreme ill health, they were simply not able to access the care that they needed. 
A very small number of countries even went as far as to establish an explicit right to palliative care. These are not only by countries where euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide are currently illegal, but also by countries where euthanasia is legal. In Belgium, for instance, one precondition for the use of euthanasia is that doctors must firstly inform patients about palliative care. Connected to the issue of accessibility is the securing of funding for items like drugs, facilities, and training of staff. Depending on how, how healthcare is financed, some countries have integrated palliative care into the financial structure of their national health service, while some countries have ensured that palliative care is embedded into insurance packages, thus making inpatient and daycare in hospices covered by health insurance. Another interesting theme that featured in the laws of some countries is the availability of temporary secured leave from work to provide care to family, friends, and even neighbors without losing their employee rights or risking termination. In Canada, for instance, such an informal carer can take leave and be entitled to compassionate care, compassionate care benefits for up to six months. And just three years ago, France granted its citizens a right to request the most extreme option of pain management. Although France has legislated on palliative care since 2005, this legislative framework deals specifically with continuous deep sedation, and it allows competent patients with a serious and incurable condition an explicit legal right to request terminal sedation when their suffering is resistant to treatment or when they decide that they no longer wish for life-sustaining treatment to continue. In cases where the terminally ill patient has lost the capacity to express their will, doctors may stop life-sustaining treatment, but are required to provide continuous deep sedation when withdrawing the life-sustaining treatment. Under this law, the provision of continuous um, deep sedation must always be accompanied by the withdrawal of artificial nutrition and hydration. This is because, as the two politicians who introduced the law put it, you do not at the same time hit the brake and the accelerator. So based on the experiences of those countries, we look next at how legal regulation is beneficial are um, in a position to, uh, to, who are in need of palliative care. For one, it can ensure access to and availability of relevant services wherever the patients and their families live in the country. As provision of care would be preceded by a needs assessment, this would ensure that the needs of children and the elderly are also taken into consideration. It would also diffuse focus beyond cancer and beyond medical treatment to include the psychosocial needs of the patient and their family. There will also be better integration with the healthcare system, which could result in a more coordinated approach and reduce overlaps. Further, money will be ring-fenced for this purpose, thereby ensuring continuity of care for the foreseeable future. The law and the dedicated injection of funds could ensure that indicators of quality are developed to standardize delivery across, across the country and that appropriate training is provided to all caregivers. This could have implications for the widening of the medical and nursing curriculums to incorporate palliative care. All this could also promote research, which could in turn lead to quality enhancement. Additionally, the law can be used not only to ensure that there is adequate supply for medicines to treat pain and other symptoms, it can also provide clarity and assurance to doctors regarding the legality of their therapeutic use of dangerous drugs. And the public and parliamentary debates that preceded the implementation of a legal framework could also increase public engagement and awareness of Stakeholders in public debates can include religious leaders who can discuss issues like whether continuous deep sedation is an acceptable form of medical care, 
Or is it, as suggested by some commentators, a slow, disguised, and socially acceptable form of euthanasia? Likewise is the question of whether clinically assisted nutrition and hydration is a form of medical treatment that can be withdrawn. Or is it basic care that should be continued during palliative sedation? To gain a deeper appreciation of some of these benefits, I will use Malaysia as a case study. Some of the issues which the country faces in respect of the need for palliative care and its patchy availability exemplify those faced in several other jurisdictions. Malaysia is a relatively small country in Asia with a population of 28 million, 61% of whom are Muslims, thereby making it a Muslim majority country. Like many countries in Asia, there has been a massive sh shift in its disease profile in the last 100 years. At the beginning of the 20th century, the country was largely burdened by infectious diseases like cholera, malaria, and smallpox. Whilst these are no longer major threats in present-day Malaysia, they have been replaced by non-communicable chronic and degenerative diseases. Indeed, up to 70% of all clinic, um, clinic attendances are now associated with conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular diseases. And with nearly 10% of the population obese, Malaysia has also been dubbed as Asia's fattest country. With chronic illnesses on the rise, four out of 10 Malaysians are estimated to need palliative care at the end of their lives, as this need, and this need is set to increase as the population ages and chronic diseases become the norm. Palliative care was introduced in Malaysia in the 1990s where two hospices were, uh, hospices were set up by NGOs to provide care in the community, and a palliative care unit was set up in a public hospital in East Malaysia. These were by and large responding to the needs of terminally ill cancer patients and are provided free of charge. This split in the kind of services provided by NGOs and the government survived to the present day. Although both involves the participation of doctors and nurses, they do not necessarily have specific training in palliative care. This is mainly because the medical and nursing curriculums in Malaysia do not generally teach this subject. There are 26 hospices in Malaysia today that provide home visits to patients in the community. They are dependent on their survival, uh, on donation and uh, fundraising. Although they were well spread, as you can see across the country, the services that they provide are of variable standards and they are located only in major cities. Given that the majority of Malaysians prefer to be cared for and die at home, a recent study shows that less than 10% of those needing community-based palliative care are actually receiving it. Similarly with inpatient care, where only 20% of public hospitals currently have palliative care units, and these are all located only in major cities. Another feature which the services offered by NGOs and the Malaysian government have retained to the present day is the emphasis on the care for cancer patients. Yet 60% of those in need of palliative care have non-cancer related conditions. Hence, some of the issues confronting the provision of palliative care in Malaysia are that they are ava only available in large cities and they're catering largely to the needs of terminally ill cancer patients. There is also a lack of good coordination between palliative care units and hospices, as in most cases they are run independently of one another. And seamless care between the two is not always a possibility for patients. There is also a lack of health professionals with specific training in palliative care, as this subject is still not taught in many medical and nursing schools in the country. And research has shown that only 10% of Malaysians have heard of palliative care. Against this backdrop, the country can certainly benefit from legal oversight of its palliative care provision. Legislative efforts can lead to the development of a coherent national strategy for palliative care, is based on a needs assessment. 
This can foster a close relationship between the two current providers so that patients can benefit from a smooth continuity of service in hospital and at home, even if they live in remote areas. Funding will also be secured for these purposes, as well as for the integration of palliative care into the country's healthcare system, and for the training of staff, as well as for increasing public awareness of the concept and the availability of palliative care. It is hoped that the discussion and the case study have shown that good quality palliative care for everyone in any particular country can and should be protected by their domestic laws. It should not be the privilege of only a few. Thank you for your attention. Very, very important. Very. Um thought-provoking conversations. What, what I'm going to do is pose this question, not just at the panel, but to the entire audience, whoever has the expertise. So I'm Maranisha, I'm based at the University of Cambridge, and I am going to unashamedly uh, take advantage of the learned audience that um, we're with today. Somebody posed this question to me, and I'm still mulling over um, how it is that I should uh, put together an answer. So maybe, maybe the two of you can help. Uh, I'm currently doing work in the UK on Muslim perspectives in palliative and end-of-life care. And one of the things that I've encountered, particularly within the private sector, is this issue of um, the global repercussions of questions around palliative and end-of-life care. So there are families that travel from the Middle East um, to um, private healthcare providers in the UK and elsewhere, I imagine. And and, and what they want is they want continued intervention, in, even in situations where healthcare professionals themselves may recognize the need for palliative and end-of-life care. And when healthcare professionals have raised this issue at multidisciplinary team meetings, at the level of hospital boards, they have been told this is what patients and families want. Our economic model relies on people coming from afar to take up our services. We're not obliged to force on them a palliative and end-of-life care model when they don't want it. So when we're thinking about legal and moral responsibilities around providing palliative and end-of-life care, I, I wanted to sort of push the conversation uh, outside of what, what you both raised and, and, and really sort of bring in this, this global conversation about people traveling to places and these issues arising in, in countries like the UK. Um, uh, I, I would have encountered uh, so, some, not many, but some patients who uh, usually they will take a relative who is actually probably not making the calls for the decision, and they are pushing him you know, to various places on the hope that there will be a new um, treatment or, uh, or uh, where uh, in reality you may have just decided, yes, he's, uh, there is no um, an, a, a medical therapy that could extend his life or uh, and without encountering so many side effects or maybe even shortening his life by subjecting him to to but these are exceptions but yes we have seen them unfortunately we also ourselves don't have options of stopping it and what is uh, more what is more difficult also, that uh, many times the governments are paying for this, and that is, and they may go into some experimental or otherwise uh, not of standard um, um, therapies, and they are paid for, they are expensive, they are paid for, but we know that outcome may not be, um, may not be good, but yet they, they are pushed to. Is that, that's what you are asking? Yeah, so that, that, that's one issue. That, uh, other is that there are institutions which are finance-driven, and then there are institutions which are which practice a general general um, um, sort of uh, standard practices. 
So they, 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 there is a, also a difference between these two. Um, so for one, one sort of um, response to that is that my, my concern with the um, private um, private sector, as it were, you're saying here, is that Middle Eastern uh, visitors or clients that come from abroad using British healthcare uh, resources, for example. So one one is the issue whether you are is it is it I guess ethically correct to impose this model upon them. Uh, it, it may be an option that can be posed, but a more difficult issue there is is the fact that. Because they are they are paying for their own private care, and what if they are provided with the best palliative care that that is available to the hospital? I'm aware, for example, in Great Ormond Street um, a Hospital, that they are treating uh, children from Middle Eastern countries, for example. Is it ethically correct that the the in, in terms of healthcare tourism here that they get a better set of palliative care services than the local British? So there is a two-tier system here on the basis of the ability to pay. So I, th I think you're right. There is an ethical uh, dilemma there. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. I'm probably posing more questions here than, than providing answers. Yes, I, I don't think this is a legal issue. If if a patient is presented with various options, including palliative care, and they say, well, thank you, I don't want the palliative care, I'd rather have the chemotherapy, I don't see a legal problem with the patient opting for the chemotherapy. Um, so our concern, I think, is to ensure that people do have the option of palliative care. I mean, that's the, the access abyss we've been talking about today. Um, if for any reason people um, are offered palliative care and, and don't choose it, that to me isn't so much of a legal problem. I mean, I, and and then ultimately it's uh, it's for the fully informed patient to make his or her own choice about what kind of treatment he or she wants. And I, I don't think the law should necessarily be trying to um, corral them into one particular <laughs> route. There may there might be all sorts of reasons why you don't want palliative care and. Or should be. Yeah, just to um, briefly, our UK lawyer answering a kind of UK law question. So the doctor will be bound by the same rules. So they'll be accountable to the GMC, General Medical Council regulatory structures, irrespective of whether it's a private or a public paying, you know, whether it's a private patient, they'll be subject to the same civil, criminal, legal responsibilities and things. But I think what's quite an interesting question that you raise is that ideas of consent that should operate as autonomy could actually be distorted and the, the motivation for kind of wanting to follow consent. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it might be a kind of neoliberal model. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I, th I th yeah, I think the practice may be getting distorted by the economics and the finance of it. But um, I just wanted to actually go back to Dr. Keown, Professor Keown, if I may, because I really sort of appreciated your mapping out the different legal regimes. But the thing I wasn't sure about is the link you make at the beginning between um, lack of availability of palliative care being a driver potentially of euthanasia, because I think as I think as um, as we, we were talking about, when we're looking at Belgium or legal or political regimes that have euthanasia, they're often also, you know, the places that have the best type of palliative care. And I think it raises a really important kind of question when we try and look at comparisons between West and non-West or global or Muslim or Christian, which is that, you know, w whether or not we can kind of map on decision making about palliative care by taking concepts such as pain and or other concept and then detaching them from certain types of, of traditions. So I, th I think I'm not, I was a bit skeptical about the link you drew at the start between socioeconomic circumstances, lack of palliative care being a driver for euthanasia. Well, let me try and reduce your skepticism a little. I think it's clear that one of the key arguments in favor of legalizing euthanasia is a concern for pain at the end of life. That's the classic example at the forefront of the case for euthanasia. Terminally ill patient in agonal pain. That's the poster child for the case for euthanasia. So when people realize that that is something of a myth, that in fact, palliative care can now control pain better than ever before, 
then their support for euthanasia tends to wane. It's because there's large-scale public ignorance about the wonderful things that palliative care can do that this great shortfall in uh, the provision of palliative care is a driver for euthanasia because many people I've spoken to over the years who support euthanasia, I say, why, well, why are you so vehement in favor of euthanasia? I saw my mother die in agony, they say. That's why. There's almost always a personal story of somebody who has seen a loved one die in pain. They connect their personal experience with the need to legalize euthanasia. It's, it's a straight correlation, one to the other. And that's because they don't realize that their loved one's treatment was, was a failure of, of medicine. The, that was an inadequacy of palliative care. So if you show people that palliative care will prevent those kinds of ends, then their support for euthanasia wanes. Thank you. Uh, I would like to address my question to Dr. Chung. Yeah, your last few uh, slides is very interesting about the case studies in Malaysia because uh, I want to know what is the factors that can speed up the progress of palliative care in Malaysia because we are neighbor and also uh, I see some uh, what is it like some barriers also are quite similar and we start together but the progress of palliative care in Malaysia uh, are more advanced compared to Indonesia thank you uh, the, if you look at the, the main problem currently is that there is a split between uh, governmental and NGOs provision and they, they, they do not speak to one another and there is no continuity of care generally. So for example, if a patient is admitted for inpatient care uh, in a palliative care unit in a hospital, if they are um, discharged, for example, they are not referred for palliative care to community-based community, community care. They, they are just a, sort of a discharge and they, do, they go home, they're given uh, some painkillers, for example, take in if, if there's any complications, go back to, to the hospital. So the two sectors currently need to speak to, to one another a little bit more. Uh, so that coordinated approach is, is important. That's one, one of the things that needs to, 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 to happen. And I think that the law in this particular regard has got a very important um, place to, to play here because once you, you you legislate on this particular uh, issue, for example, the, the, the conversations that take place bef before that happens, based on needs assessment, for example, and what are the inadequacies of the, of the, of the current system, that would actually help to, to highlight what, what, are the, what are the current uh, problems that needs to be, uh, to be addressed. So I think the law would be one, uh, having some sort of legislation. Secondly, greater conversation between the two sectors. And some ring fencing of money um, as well, because um, as I mentioned, the NGOs are currently running on, on funds and, and donation, and that, that is not sustainable um, in, in, a, in a long run. Um, thank you. I was sort of going to carry on from the previous comment, really, and slightly challenge John as well, because uh, when you look at places of that talk about having palliative care, we're talking about different things in different countries. In Belgium, some of us would say it's really actually pretty rudimentary, but they're claiming that they've got excellent palliative care. And there's, there are, if you look at services, there's specialists and then there's skills across the whole population. If we're looking at the way that we staff these services, wherever they are, we are quite often bringing staff from other countries. So for example, in the UK, we brought over a lot of Filipino nurses who provided superb nursing care to patients. But I think that raises another ethical issue, really, because we are taking people to service our wealthy economy, so-called services, and in a way exploiting them they are earning with us, sending money home. What I know there are all kinds of arguments about the international economics of it. But then they're all coming in and providing generalist services. And what they're doing is they're being very caring. And when you talk at the other end of that to a patient, you can describe palliative care. You can describe what you might do. They don't believe it until they experience it. So. People talk about having palliative care as if it's like having a course of antibiotics, but it isn't. You know, you take 
ampicillin, if you've got an infection, it either works or it doesn't work. But palliative care is, is about looking at the whole person in a very holistic way and meeting their needs. And so I really worry that there's this formulaic view that somehow you can deliver it. And whilst you're right, I completely agree with you, the poster child has been the bad experience that somebody has from years ago. Because they haven't seen how death can be well managed, because we're not bringing them in to places, actually those images not only persist, but get exploited by people who are very frightened about their own future, frightened of dependency. So the drivers for euthanasia and, and uh, physician assisted suicide requests uh, come from a lack of control and a social much more than that they're physical or medical. So, so we've got lots of cross currents going on being muddled up and then we've got this pressure well but at the end of the day we'll get the doctor to kill the patient and then that solves everybody's problem. But of course it doesn't, because we're storing up another set of memories for the next generation, quite apart from do we end life with ignorance much sooner than it ought to be. And so I, I, I'm not, I really don't think that if you provide palliative care, you solve the problem. I think actually what you might be doing is allowing all those bad memories to be repeated across society and taking people away into beautiful, lovely environments staffed by people you've brought from other countries quite often to fund it and look after them. And a few people see that they've had a lovely, that they've had a, a lovely last few days, weeks or months, but they don't go around talking about it because why would they? because it was fine. So it's only the people who are angry who are hanging on to that anger and driving it. But actually, the more that we provide those services that take people away, the more we allow that gap to widen. And I think there's this control message which is driving the pressure for physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. I'm not sure, I don't think I'd disagree with any of that, Laura. And I, I didn't want to suggest that if you provide adequate palliative care, that is the solution to the campaign for euthanasia. We know it's not. Uh, all I'm saying is that failures to provide adequate palliative care are a recruiting sergeant for the euthanasia cause. So if you, if you do uh, ameliorate that problem, then to that extent, you take the wind to an extent out of the sails of the euthanasia campaign. Not suggesting it's the whole solution at all. I wanted to ask you two, two questions, quite quick answers, I think. Um, when you're talking about palliative care within England or United Kingdom, I was wondering, is there a pronounced geographical difference in different areas? Um, I mean, for example, would the north be um, less or more than other areas? The other thing I was mindful of, thinking of Northern Ireland, <laughs> was that the emotive questions that they have about abortion and does uh, do the laws um, for palliative care, all the rules apply the same across, for example, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and England? We've got one of the country's leading palliative care experts here who can... <laughs> Basically, um, the political premise in the different parts of the UK over palliative specialist palliative care provision was different. So in Wales, we set a minimum level for the whole country and divided up a pot of money that we had to make sure that wherever you lived, if you had difficult problems, you could access specialist palliative care. Not terribly gold-plated, but it was like brass-plated for everybody. That politically fitted with the political climate of the country. In England, you have wide variations in the provision of specialist palliative care. There are black holes and there are areas of what I would term quite major over provision, where the palliative care services are providing, specialist palliative care services are providing what would in other areas be provided by geriatric medicine or pediatric care or whatever in, in other units. 
of, when you look at abortion, of course, the law in Northern Ireland is different. But in terms of provision of specialist palliative care in Northern Ireland, it's hit the problem of having different groups who have basically been fighting each other. So you've got black holes, but due to, to a very, it's, it's got some pretty bad history, but it's got some very good clinical services. Where the clinical services are, they're very good, they're very, good very high standard. No. No, 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 it's not. I mean, the problems in Northern Ireland are really... Um, mm. It's without... How can I... How can I it, it's, it's tribal, OK? It, it's much more tribal than truly religious. religious. I, I think it is, it is quite... But, but that hasn't really driven what's gone on. The tribal mentality has happened between the two hospices. Uh, the, the two main ones, not religion. But, but that's been the political driver in England of, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom and let's see which ones wither, and the competitive conservative politics versus the socialist politics in Wales join in the discussion and link some of these issues because I think I think there's a really important relationship between these two points our colleagues from Cambridge and what was asked about cross religious traditions and how we do comparison across Malaysia for example in the UK west non west because one of the really interesting questions is this like distinction between whether or not there are universal norms that one applies end of life definitions of palliative care and what role culture tradition race whatever the way it operates on that. So what, that's one of the issues you're interested in exploring, presumably. I mean, I haven't done work on palliative care, but we were really interested in exploring this, this issue in the context of how you, you use some, a standard like best interest of the child when children are taken into care. So I don't know if it translates properly, but what we found in our research, socio-legal research, after interviews, was that in that case, um, social workers and child protection workers were making a mistake in the way in which they thought that certain universal ethical standards about what's in the best interests of the child would vary for ethnic minorities, different cultures. And all they needed to do was to maybe spend a little bit of time talking through ethnic minority families and or different religious families, Catholic, Protestant or Muslim Christian, do a bit more work in talking through with the minority culture family to get them actually to the same position. You didn't need a different standard. There weren't different ethics at work there. And I think to a certain extent we're thinking about this set of issues and issues about Muslim Christian dialogue are looking at that issue sometimes. But the final caveat where I think, I think that there are different traditions. And I think it's a mistake to think that universal norm will d definitely dissolve those very real, often ethical differences of how someone experiences ethical concepts or a concept such as pain and the ability to endure suffering at the end of life without adequate palliative care, without that being a driver of euthanasia, will vary depending on whether you're in Belgium or whether you're in different a different tradition. And to a certain extent, I was questioning Dr. Keown's your assumption that certain of these arguments about that are really, you know, Polly Toynbee makes this argument about euthanasia all the time. My father really suffered and therefore, right? One of the most influential euthanasia campaigners in the UK with the global audience. I mean, I, I agree with your skepticism about that, but I just wonder whether those arguments that have traction in the West translate well into other cultures and traditions where the ability to suffer pain is rooted in a very different experience. Yeah, I, I agree. And if you look at the Human Rights Watch global reports every few years about palliative care, it's clear that there are, there are different perceptions and understandings about what, what it is to suffer pain. And, but um, in a sense, my, my argument um, isn't affected by that. So uh, when I was reading their report about countries in Africa, where people are dying in agonizing pain. And they're told, well, yeah, but that's how you're supposed to die. That's what dying is, you know, it's supposed to be painful. Um, so my argument is, well, it needn't be painful. <laughs> so I think they're wrong to think that that's how dying has to be and should be. Um, and, and they're not even offered the opportunity of a, of a, of a painful death. So 
I don't think they'd be opting for euthanasia under the present situation or under a fusion situation. But I think culturally sometimes these ideas are pernicious. The idea that you ought to die in pain is not something we should be encouraging. Well, this is in the West because we don't we we now don't know what to do with suffering. I think partly through the de decline of religion, we can't make sense of suffering, and we just want to try and eliminate it by eliminating ourselves. So I, I still think there's that linkage. Um, uh, even though perhaps we realize, yeah, the doctor could probably do something for my suffering, but even if they could, what's the point? So I think we see this in, in countries like the Netherlands and Belgium, it's, it's a movement towards existential suffering. You know, I just don't see the point of enduring any suffering, you know, if I don't want to. Um. I, I just wonder whether, first of all, it is meaning. So what does whatever's happening to mean to you? And if you are from a theist, tradition, whatever that belief is, you believe in something higher than yourself. If you don't come from a theist, whether it's Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever it is, background, then all you can believe is believe in yourself, and that puts the burden of control on you, uh, and can also bring along a whole lot of other questions, but a lot around control um, and not much, uh, uh, you don't have much of a background in which to think about meaning until it hits you in the face and then that's not the time to be philosophical because by then you'll come to terms with what's happening to you. So I wonder whether the divide is actually between theist and the sort of very atheist not even agnostic, because often people turn to religion surprisingly once they've got big problems, and suffering is around meaning. Just thinking in, in relation to the previous question, I guess maybe some connection to the present one, is that when, you, when you're talking about children earlier on, the position taken by English law is, is, is a very standard one for children. Um, I mean, if you look at the position of Jehovah's Witnesses, children, for example, who needs blood, trans uh, blood transfusion, it, the law does, uh, doesn't allow a parent's will. For, 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 if their parents wish, for example, that they do not accept blood transfusion, that is um, overridden uh, by, by, by the law because they're looking at the best interest of the child. So when it comes to religious sensitivities or religious, um, yeah, so re religious least sensitive healthcare only applies to adults and doesn't seem to apply to children. I'm not exactly sure whether that is the correct position to take, but if you contrast it, for example, with the position in Belgium whereby children can also ask, uh, can also accept euthanasia, for example, um, there is, I think there's an obvious split there uh, in terms of which is the more ethically correct position. Should children's uh, will, should uh, religious sensitivities also apply in the case of children? Uh, so, or do you take religion completely out of the uh, of the equation? Uh, so, I guess yeah, yeah. That's posing another question to to the question that you have asked. Good afternoon. My name is Akin Akinade. I'm from Nigeria, and I'm a professor of theology at Georgetown. Welcome to panel three on framing palliative care, ethical concepts, and principles. We have two speakers, and each speaker we all will speak for 40 minutes, and after that we have time for Q&A. Our first speaker is Dr. Somesi. Dr. Somesi is Professor of Biomedical Ethics in the Departments of Medicine and Philosophy at Georgetown University, where he's also the Acting Director of the Kennedy Institute of, Institute of Ethics, and a member of the Pellegrino Center for Cl Clinical Bioethics. He received his BA or AB and MD degrees from Cornell University, completed his residency, chief residency and postdoctoral fellowship in general internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and also holds a PhD in philosophy from Georgetown. He has previously held faculty positions at New York Medical College and at the University of Chicago. is the author and editor of six books. Our second speaker is Dr. Asim Padilla, who is the director of the Initiative on Islam and Medicine 
Associate Professor of Medicine in the section of Emergency Medicine and a faculty member of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and also a professor in the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Dr. Padilla holds an MD from Well Cornell Medical College, completed residency in emergency medicine at the University of Rochester, and received an MSc in healthcare research from the University of Michigan. Prior to that, he received bachelor's degrees in biomedical engineering and classical Arabic and literature from the University of Rochester. So join me in welcoming our two speakers. Dr. Salmesi is going to speak first, and after that, Dr. Padilla will speak. We will also speak. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for that uh, gracious introduction. Thanks to all of you for staying to the end. Um, uh, I hope that. Um, Dr. Padella and I have tried to coordinate what we're uh, saying, and at the end of the day, hopefully it'll be lively enough to keep you um, your heads from dropping, so thank you. Um, I was asked to talk about um, Catholic Christian approaches to uh, care at the end of life from an, uh, from an ethical um, perspective, and here's the sort of outline of the way I'm going to approach it. Um, first, I'm going to, to uh, describe for you some fundamentals um, in terms of um, principles and the structure of reasoning for, um, for, for Catholic ethical thinking in general. Um, and then uh, the two of us thought that maybe the best way that we could um, foster an interreligious dialogue would be if we you know, took the um, perspective of duties, um, that we would talk first of the duties of the sick um, and then the duties of the caregivers. And that's how I'm going to uh, organize things. So here are some fundamentals. They should be um, familiar to many people, but um, uh, perhaps um, uh, will be presented in a fresh way, particularly for um, the Muslims uh, in the audience. Uh, they, we as Catholic Christians see life as a gift uh, from God. Um, see human beings as having been made in the divine uh, image. Um, I was enlightened by Professor Musa's um, uh, illumination of how the, the uh, Muslim perspective on that with a um, real reluctance to take up anything that is image creating um, still find a way to sort of um, have a sense of, uh, of this. Um, but it's uh, um, twofold from a Catholic perspective. Not only are we, uh, do we have value as human beings because we are made in God's image, but we also have a value conferred on us by God's love for us, um, particularly through, um, uh, uh, through the person of Jesus uh, Christ, um, who we believe to be God in the world. Um, both um, traditions, however, I think would accept that the image is not an exemplar, uh, is not the exemplar, right? That human life is extremely valuable, um, but only the Almighty is infinitely valuable. And this is um, something that I think we hold um, in common. Um, the way in which contemporary Catholics think about the value of human beings and the value of human life, which are indistinguishable from each other. There are no human beings who aren't alive and embodied as creatures. Um, that our dignity, as the scripture would uh, uh, tell us, is more than that of the sparrows, that we are uh, have a greater value than other aspects of creation, but we have a value that is also less than that of the angels, that we are not infinitely valuable as God is and not even perhaps as valuable as the angels. Um, but this value that we have um, is considered by Catholics to be intrinsic um, to human beings. Um, it's the value that we as human beings have by virtue of nothing else than being the kinds of things that we are created by a loving God. Um, this gives every human being and every human life a radical equality. Um, absolutely across um, every nation, every creed, every culture, radical equality. Um, and also the uh, a term that's used um, in American uh, law and history from our Declaration of Independence about rights um, is very true, is truer in some ways about dignity, that it is inalienable. It is not something that a human being 
can dispose of, can give away, nor can it ever be taken away from a human being by any circumstance. That as a background, um, we'll look to the sources that Catholics use for moral reasoning. Um, uh, one of those is uh, certainly scripture, and we would hold that um, in common uh, with Islam. Um, but Catholics put a greater emphasis on a, a philosophical approach called natural law that I will describe uh, to you. Um, but it is not the only source of reasoning about um, ethics in the Catholic tradition. There is also a virtue um, a, a tradition um, and a casuistic tradition, a case-based reasoning a tradition which um, actually has um, some resonances that are more um, uh, common with the Islamic tradition. So from the scripture, um, at least a Catholic perspective would say that there are some specific rules that um, are part uh, particularly of uh, the new covenant, um, but that um, Jesus uh, in his moral teachings was more in some ways exhortative uh, than legislative. Um, um, and, um, and because of that, Catholics put a greater um, emphasis in some ways on natural law. Um, and all of us um, need to recognize recognize um, that um, whatever our scriptural tradition, whether it is um, uh, the uh, books of the Bible or the Quran, um, um, doesn't give us um, exact rules for how to live, particularly in a contemporary technological era. Um, my example is that neither Moses nor Jesus nor the prophet, peace be on all of them, told us what to do about genetics, right? Uh, we can take precepts from the scriptures, but there is no way to escape the fact that we have to interpret that and we have to reason, use reason about that. Catholics have put a greater emphasis on the reasoning about this um, because we don't have a lot of exact rules um, within our scriptures. Um, but we do believe um, that there is a law written in the hearts of all human beings by the one who made us. Um, that we are, perhaps as uh, um, Professor Musa was suggested, having predispositions to act in a certain way, um, and to reason about things in a godlike way a divinely inspired way. And because of this, all people of goodwill can reason about ethics. Um, and this is the way in which um, Catholics have traditionally thought about, um, uh, about um, ethics. This natural law written in our hearts that we can reason about is incomplete without revelation, but it is universal to human beings who are created to be moral uh, creatures. So I'll give you some selected precepts from um, uh, the, the, the natural law. The first is to recognize that this does not mean that, that a natural lawyer believes that biology dictates ethics. Um, um, but it is about um, our nature, the kinds of beings that we are, and what it takes for us to flourish. The first precept of the natural law should be universal to everyone. The, um, as Thomas Aquinas described it, it is uh, good to be, is to be done and evil is to be avoided, right? Everybody ought to be able to agree with that as a starting point. Um, Catholic natural law thinking also puts a lot of emphasis on the way in which we think about the particular acts that we do. Um, what is the object of our action? What's the intention with which we um, are engaging in that action? What are we aiming at? Um, what are the effects of that um, action and what are the circumstances in which um, that action it, uh, takes place? And there are a huge tradition that um, um, expounds upon those kinds of ways of analyzing human actions. And then from um, taking some precepts and I'm Putting, highlighting this one, some of it comes actually out of Roman law, um, um, which is that negative precepts bind absolutely and positive precepts only up to a point. And I'm emphasizing that one because it will be important in talking about end of life care. Another source of moral thinking for uh, Catholic Christians is about virtue. Um, virtues are habitual traits of character that predispose us to human excellence, um, to being, um, to flourishing as human beings. Um, they're divided typically classically into cardinal virtues, 
Um, virtues that are um, human um, can be taught by example and by practice. Um, the four cardinal virtues are prudence, temperance, courage, and justice. Um, prudence is about practical wisdom. Um, Temperance about our need um, to uh, be controlled in the way in which we um, act in the world, to not um, um, act solely on our desires and appetites. Um, courage, um, obviously a universal um, a moral trait, and, um, um, and a mean, if you will, between um, either um, being um, reckless um, or timid. Um, um, and then justice, um, um, both in our interactions with individuals um, and the world. Um, but Catholics also believe that there are supernatural virtues, which are gifts uh, from God. Um, by the, and I was intrigued to know that there is a concept of grace also um, in the Muslim uh, tradition. Um, the supernatural virtues, we believe, can come to us only through um, the grace of God. And these are the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, um, faith um, um, in, um, in God, um, hope um, in God, and charity that we receive from God and, uh, and, and tells us to be charitable um, to our brothers and sisters um, in return. The other great font of, um, uh, of Catholic um, Christian thinking about ethics um, is casuistry or case-based reasoning. Um, and there's a whole body of literature that comes down to us this way, which um, has much of its roots um, in confessional practice. Um, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Catholic Christian practice of confessing um, our sins, this was very literal um, um, to um, at least initially publicly and then privately to priests. Um, and and a, a whole literature um, uh, evolved of, of priests um, being able to have manuals in which they decided whether how, what kind of advice to give um, to the person who had sinned um, and how to classify what is morally appropriate, what isn't. Um, and this became a, a, a font of case-based reasoning. Um, there's also case-based reasoning in canon law, um, which has more to do with the life of a Christian, Catholic Christian specific to the church, um, confessional practice more about what we do in our daily life. Um, and these are ways of applying natural law and virtue theory to particular uh, problems. Um, and this has a strong analogy, this tradition, to, um, uh, to I think the Muslim tradition of fiqh. So. I, the way I'm going to divide the rest of the talk, um, as I said, duties of, this, of the sick and duties of the, um, uh, of the caregivers will be according to um, those supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and charity for each. So what are the duties of the sick according to faith, hope, and charity? What are the duties uh, of the caregiver according to faith, hope, and charity? Um, starting with the duties of the sick um, in faith, um, Catholic Christian who is sick, mom and perhaps terminally ill from that, um, has to begin by having accepted life as a gift from God. Um, there are some moral absolutes because this life is a gift from God, that there is to be no suicide on that person's part in the face of, uh, of sickness. Um, in Thomas Aquinas's arguments for this, um, um, basically it boils down to saying it is unnatural, um, 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 uh, it is um, um, uh, ungrateful and antisocial. Um, um, it's unnatural in the sense, again, I think that we heard about um, uh, this morning that, that living things tend to perpetuate and life um, is something that continues um, uh, to be um, uh, something that um, is of its very nature something that perpetuates itself. Um, it is thought to be um, ungrateful um, to, to the creator who gave us the gift of life, um, and it is antisocial in the sense um, that it is very true, as psychiatrists will tell you today, uh, that no suicide um, is a merely self-regarding and private act, that we are connected to each other, um, and that anyone's death diminishes the rest of us. Um, and so these are the reasons, typically given from natural law, why the person who is a a faithful Catholic cannot commit suicide, even in the face of serious illness. Um, Catholic Christians um, 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 
are also uh, impelled um, to seek medical care, to be good stewards of the gift of life. We've been given this gift, and so we are encouraged um, to see doctors, to um, practice preventive um, uh, medicine, um, and to nurture um, and be good stewards of the gift that we've been given of life. But as a positive precept of the law, um, it is only um, a duty up to a point, right? Um, negative precepts, do not kill, do not commit adultery, are absolutely binding. Positive um, precepts of the law, like give alms um, or care for yourself, bind only up to a point. And that is the, the beginning um, of the tradition in Catholic Christianity um, of the distinction between ordinary and extraordinary means of care, which was actually worked out by Catholic theologians in the 15th to 16th centuries of the, uh, of the Common Era. Um, and there are limits then uh, to the duty one has to preserve one's life and to be a good steward of one's life. And that is when the treatment that's being offered by the doctors is either futile um, or if the burdens become disproportionate to the benefits. So you are obligated to do things that um, are simple, um, easy, common, um, but when they become too burdensome or they are not going to work, um, then you do not have to engage um, in those medical acts. Individuals um, are in charge, even within the Catholic tradition, of deciding what those are, because all of us are different, right? Our pain thresholds will differ, our moral and psychological resources will differ, so it's always within the Catholic tradition been an individual judgment, so one person, what's extraordinary or too burdensome for one person is not what will be extraordinary or too burdensome um, for another. Um, not absolute latitude, so that there are some moral absolutes like suicide or euthanasia that you can't ask for, um, but there are um, these sorts of, um, uh, of individual latitudes about deciding what's become um, too burdensome. So for an example, um, in its day, um, back in the um, 15th and 16th century, the doctor could say um, that you really should eat partridge because it would be better for your health. And the person might say, well, um, I can't afford partridge. I can only afford chicken, all right? Um, that person would be able to say, even though the doctor told you you should eat partridge, you don't have to eat partridge. You can eat just chicken, okay? Um, partridge becomes an extraordinary means, chicken an ordinary means of treating um, a person's um, illness. That tradition, um, or it might be that the doctor says, for your health, you should go to the Alps and you're a poor peasant in Sicily, um, and you say, well, this is going to separate me from my family, I'm going to spend all my money to go there, do I have to do it? And again, the wise um, uh, pastoral uh, penitent, uh, pastoral uh, priest would say, no, you only have to do ordinary things, you don't have to do something so extraordinary, even if it might be life prolonging to go to the Alps. Um, being bankrupted and leaving your family is more than you need to do to be a good steward of your body. You have reached the limit of what you need um, to do. That's extraordinary. Some specifics of how these cases get analyzed. The perspective is always the perspective of the patient. Um, it is what is too much for that individual. So for instance, in the tradition, an abbot could not require a monk to undergo an amputation. He couldn't command him under obedience because um, it was up to that individual um, to decide that, that the pain involved in the amputation and the life of, um, of not having a leg would be too burdensome. Um, these are in the days before uh, anesthesia um, and therefore would not be required to do it. Ordinary and extraordinary refer to the obligation um, not to the intervention itself. So you can't say a priori that a ventilator is always um, ordinary, uh, um, or a ventilator is always extraordinary, and antibiotics, for instance, are always ordinary. You have to think about the specific use of a specific treatment in specific circumstances. 
Ordinary um, means that it is required, um, uh, typically, other things being equal, and extraordinary means that it's optional, other things being equal. It doesn't mean, extraordinary doesn't mean it's got a lot of whistles and bells. You can't say, for instance, that antibiotics are always ordinary in the abstract. You have to say in a specific case, um, and there may be a case in which it is, a um, person is very close to death, of dying of a, um, a Borhov syndrome where they've, um, they're, uh, um, uh, Trachea, windpipe, and um, food pipe, the esophagus, are now in communication because of a cancer, and they're pouring gastric juices into, the, um, into their lungs. It may be that in such a case, the pneumonia that the person had might be treatable um, partly by antibiotics, but it might extend their life by only minutes, if at all. Um, antibiotics could become an extraordinary burden for that person in those particular circumstances, even though um, if you had pneumonia, you would want to uh, have um, a Z-pack and take five days of azithromycin um, and get through it, okay? And then it would be ordinary. These simple things were applied by Pius, Pope Pius XII in the 20th century, um, this tradition, um, um, to saying that ventilators would be ordinary, normally morally required for an appendectomy, but could be extraordinary, morally optional, when merely when all they were doing was prolonging dying and associated with great suffering. And so the same kind of analysis can be extended to dialysis, chemotherapy, blood transfusions, et cetera. They can be judged to be extraordinary for a particular individual. Catholic Christians do not distinguish between withholding and withdrawing of care. Um, this distinction is not morally decisive for Catholics. Um, either way, um, whether you withhold a ventilator, let's say, or withdraw a ventilator, what you're doing is assessing the effectiveness, the benefit, and the burden, deciding whether it's futile or, or more uh, burdensome than beneficial and therefore extraordinary. And there are cases in which it is sometimes wiser to give a therapeutic trial, right, to try the ventilator and then determine that it's not working and then uh, discontinue it. Yet, I think we all would recognize that it is psychologically more difficult to withdraw care, but from um, a purely um, theological point of view, the, the um, withholding or withdrawing distinction does not itself make a difference. What about the duties of the patient with regard to hope? Well, um, um, ultimate hope for a Christian, um, as I would suspect for a Muslim, is in God. Um, uh, and here's a beautiful quote from St. Basil of Caesarea, one who places all his hope in a doctor is acting like an irrational animal, <laughs> right? Um, our hope should be ultimately in God. Um, um, we have um, duties um, um, to care for ourselves, but again, they can reach limits. They will reach limits for all of us. Um, Christians also have duties to prepare for death, and there could be, again, I think lots of crosstalk um, uh, here, um, that people should um, prepare for death through prayer, through the use of sacraments. Um, uh, last communion is called viaticum, or food for the journey for a Catholic. Um, there's a last confession to be made. There's a sacrament of the sick, where a person um, 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 would um, be able to receive a sacrament of anointing of their body as they are prepared um, to meet their maker. Um, there is a tradition starting in the medieval times that continues up into the 20th um, um, century, not as well, that we need probably a revival of, called the Ars Moriendi, um, a way of preparing for death, and ultimately um, a spiritual view um, that we surrender um, ourselves into, into hope, uh, in hope, um, in, to, into God, hear the call of God to come back to God and trusting in God, ultimately the proper spiritual thing to do in the face of death may be to, um, to, to surrender to the will of God calling us back. And duties of charity um, also are incumbent upon um, a, a Catholic Christian who is dying. So one can include, for instance, charitably burdens to others when one is deciding whether something is extraordinary, um, whether it's more burdensome than beneficial, the burdens may be those for others. So for instance, a Catholic Christian could say, yes, I could get a transfusion, but I have um, um, O negative blood, it's very rare, um, and you know, I've had 30 transfusions in the last, um, 
some year, um, um, and this disease, I'm dying ultimately of non-transplantable uh, uh, liver disease. Um, I will, in fact, um, include in my decision about what is too burdensome the burden on others that I'm taking their, the blood supply away from them um, and... Um, Consider that to be part of my calculus of what becomes more uh, burdensome than beneficial. Uh, the needs of others um, can also be taken up by those who are dying in terms of alms giving and, um, and giving away one's possessions um, and uh, caring for the needs of, uh, of the rest of one's family. I'd say there's less emphasis in that in the Catholic tradition than there is in Islam, but it's part of our own uh, tradition as well. That's under those faith, hope, and charity, what I want to say about the, the duties of the um, uh, sick. What about the duties of healthcare professionals? Um, in faith, healthcare professionals also have to see life as a gift from God and see medicine also as a gift from God. In the wisdom of Ben Syra, um, which is a canonical uh, book of scripture for Catholics, in the, um, there is a physician's poem. It says, from, doc from God the doctor obtains his knowledge, and God makes the earth yield healing herbs by which the doctor eases pain. Physicians need to have in faith to see that their very profession comes from God. Um, thus, we can see God as working through us, um, as an instrument of healing. Um, but a Catholic Christian will also look at the work of, of health care as being able to see God, the face of God, in the face of the sick. Um, and this is an important part, I think, of the way in which Jesus teaches. Um, in the uh, Gospel of, uh, of Matthew, Jesus says that um, in visiting the sick, we are visiting him, Right? We're visiting the divine when we see the sick, and if we can see the divine in the face of the sick, we are actually experiencing God ourselves by caring for them. And that's an important part of the faith um, perspective of a Catholic Christian. In hope, um, I think we have to distinguish, and this may be important, um, in, um, particularly in some uh, cultures, that hope is not the same thing as optimism. Um, although he's not a Christian, I think this very much um, um, uh, um, is, a, is a Christian sentiment. Vaclav Havel said that hope um, um, is not the conviction that everything will turn out well, that's optimism, but that things will make sense no matter how they turn out. That's hope, right? Um, the virtue of humility is important to, uh, um, to uh, physicians. The function of medicine is not to relieve the human condition of the human condition. We are not gods, right? Um, we are only human um, physicians. Hippocrates said that when the pa patient is overmastered by disease, do not continue to treat, recognizing that in such situations, medicine is powerless. We have to be able um, to have faith ourselves also in God and hope in God and recognize humbly the limits of what medicine can do. And therefore, in striking the balance, we don't try to overtreat, to overestimate what we can do, while at the same time that we do not usurp prerogatives that belong only to God and not ourselves engage in killing. So no euthanasia or assisted suicide um, from a Catholic physician. And what are our duties in charity? Uh, well, as I might have mentioned this morning, healing was central um, to the ministry of Jesus. And while the Romans abandoned the sick, Christians began to start hospitals. Uh, we do believe that there is an absolute duty, um, yeah, moral duty to relieve the suffering of our brothers and sisters, um, unless doing so would violate respect for God um, or ultimate respect for life. Um, as you heard this afternoon, the modern hospice movement from Cicely Saunders was really inspired uh, by uh, Christian uh, charity, and that we um, have a, a conviction that we must use all the gifts we have to ease the suffering of the sick, and that we do so um, uh, charitably, and this is part of a Christian calling um, to help the sick. In doing so, you heard a little bit about something called the rule of double effect. I just want to go through this. Again, it comes out of the natural law tradition of uh, Catholic Christianity. Um, it's attributed to, uh, to Aquinas, although he doesn't actually ever quite say this, and it's really worked out by commentators on him, again, in the 15th and 16th centuries. 
But basically, this rule says that in general, not just in medicine, if you have one action that has two effects, um, one of which is good and one of which is bad, the action itself is not intrinsically wrong to do, that you foresee um, the bad following from it, but only intend the good, uh, that the bad is not the cause of the good, and you have a proportionate reason for acting that the good outweighs the bad and the means fit the end, then you can engage in that action. Okay? Um, uh, now, this happens in all kinds of ways and has been used in all kinds of ways, but when, when it's thought about, when it's applied to morphine, here's, here's how the argument goes. Um, morphine maybe has two effects, right? One of which is to relieve pain. The other may be to um, make some, cloud somebody's consciousness, or it may be to decrease their uh, rate of breathing, which we fear might hasten death. In many cases, it doesn't. In almost all cases, it doesn't. But you might fear that that might happen, and there may be cases when it does. So those are the things that are the bad side effects that you're worried about. Um, it is not itself immoral to use morphine to relieve pain. Um, people do it, I'm sure, um, at the time of surgery or any other kinds of, um, of, of treatments, even outside of um, the um, end-of-life care. If your intention in doing so is to relieve pain, foreseeing that it might, in rare circumstances, hasten death, it is clear that the patient's um, uh, death is not the cause of pain relief, right? We don't relieve people's pain with morphine by killing them, right? Um, it acts, in fact, at different um, subclasses of mu receptors within the body. Um, the mu receptors that are necessary for pain relief are different from the subclass that, that um, decrease respiratory drive. And when the time is short and the person is in excruciating pain, uh, the risks that we see for that outweigh the, uh, the, uh, of the risks of, of haste, potentially hastening death um, are outweighed by the need to relieve that person's um, suffering. And so even for Catholic Christians who are extraordinarily opposed um, to euthanasia, we can engage in giving patients um, morphine um, under double effect, even if it might um, unintentionally, um, in very rare instances, um, hasten their death. It is a ubiquitous concept in medicine. Um, it's the, basically the concept of a side effect. Um, so I can give somebody penicillin for seeing the possibility they might have anaphylactic shock from it, which is foreseeable. Um, I don't intend that. They don't have to have anaphylactic shock in order to relieve um, their, uh, uh, their infection. Um, and the good of treating their infection um, is um, outweighed by the very small risk uh, of anaphylactic shock. And so I can go ahead and do it. Um, if it weren't for this kind of thinking, we wouldn't do almost anything in medicine. So I think it's simply an application of that kind of thinking um, to the use of opioids. What are our duties um, in charity besides pain control? Um, I think they are to accompany the dying, to assure them of their dignity at a time of fierce doubt, um, because illness can, in fact, make people doubt their own value. Um, um, and we want to assure for them a palliative, uh, a, a spiritual care as part of palliative care. So here are a few explicit um, Catholic Christian positions. Um, that euthanasia and assisted suicide are always morally wrong, neglectful of the, our relationship with others and abusing uh, and an abuse of the gift of life, that ventilators and almost all um, treatments can be both withheld and withdrawn if they are determined to be extraordinary in particular cases, and it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Feeding tubes, current teaching is a little more complex, um, the um, uh, church has currently um, uh, determined that in chronic, non-progressive, otherwise uncomplicated neurologic disorders like the persistent vegetative state, there's a, pro a strong presumption in favor of tube feeding. Um, but even in those cases, it could become extraordinary. Um, and certainly in progressively fatal uh, diseases like um, uh, cancers, um, they can be um, uh, certainly be considered uh, an extraordinary means of, of treatment. Uh, let me um, end by illustrating this. Um, anybody recognize the, uh, the artwork? Uh, Asim does. He's, he's heard this before. 
Um, this is Giotto's fresco of the death of St. Francis of Assisi. It's in the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, church in Florence. Um, and it is, um, I think, a depiction of Christian death with dignity um, in the 13th century. What you see in this picture is not a single ventilator. There are no feeding tubes. There are no IVs, right? Um, there is a man who is dying, who is surrounded by people who love him, who care for him, care about him, are praying with him. Um, Giotto paints this with, um, you know, um, uh, um, actually, if I can get this here, this friar is actually looking um, at what is the soul, depicted as the soul of, of Francis as it's leaving his body and going into the arms um, of God. Um, Francis, um, um, at the end of his life, had um, a, a syndrome in which he was ble he was uh, tearing excessively, um, and um, it was one of, it was part of his uh, final um, uh, illness. And so they sent him to the doctors in the town of Rieti because um, he had been refusing doctors, um, and they cauterized his temples with hot irons to try to stop this, and it didn't work. Um, um, kept tearing excessively, and so the doctors offered to do what doctors always do when the treatment doesn't work, which is try it again, try it again, try it again. And what did Francis say? No, basta, this is enough. Um, 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 I have done what I need to do to be a good steward of my body. He refused an extraordinary means of care. Um, his appetite was really poor. Um, again, nobody tried to put a feeding tube into him, but Lady Jacoba, his patroness from Rome, came and gave him little bits of almond cookie. Um, he took communion, a little bit of wafer, um, um, and, um, um, and he died um, um, in this setting. Um, and Giotto paints this with great intimacy. Um, one of the friars who's surrounding him is actually kissing the stigmatous wound of his hand, which were thought to be the wounds of Christ in the body of, of St. Francis himself. Um, if, um, I think this is death with dignity. Um, I think it was possible in the 13th century. It should be possible in the 21st. Um, if we are able to use our technologies wisely um, to understand how um, our faith traditions can inform our medical thinking um, even in the present day. So thank you very much. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabi wa mawala. Uh, alhamdulillah, it is, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, Dean Dalal, uh, Georgetown faculty, uh, individuals from the Pontifical Academy for Life. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be following one of my mentors and teachers, Dan Salmezi. Um, you will notice that, uh, as I've learned from him, our thinking is very much alike. So there'll be so many similarities that you'll think that we're giving the same talk, um, really. But, but that's, uh, that's just uh, you know, uh, the fact that there is so much in common between our faith traditions and uh, teacher to student relationship. So with that, uh, I want to start by saying that uh, I and the initiative in Islamic medicine that I lead works at this intersection of research between the Islamic tradition, biomedicine, and Muslim practices. We study how uh, the Islamic faith of Muslim patients impacts their health behaviors and how it produces at times challenges within the healthcare system. We study how Islam informs the professional identities of Muslim physicians, and how, again, that might lead to certain challenges in the healthcare environment. Then we also study how uh, religious scholars pontificate and, and proclamate over biomedicine, their texts, and how they do analysis of biomedicine as a body of knowledge. So we conduct empirical, textual, and theological research, and today in my talk, I'm going to try to draw these strands together, thinking about perhaps not as much clarity as Professor Salmezi did, thinking about end-of-life care and palliative care, because the title of this, of this panel is Framing Palliative Care. So first, I'm going to kind of map out the terrain, and then kind of give you a path through it, framing palliative care within the Islamic tradition. And the terrain, I think, is one that we all share, that today health is more of a commodity, or is thought of as a commodity that we purchase, right? We have industries that think about, I am buying, wearing a Fitbit, right, that we can sell and produce health 
although there might be data that says that that has no benefit at all to longevity, wellness, or health at all. That people think about our being able to decode, right, the genetic code and understand knowledge, right, about health. Um, it's become an industry, and I think economics and, that, and how that plays a role in social structuring of healthcare is important to think about even in this context. From that, you try to understand that this is a larger symptom of what we think about as life, right? Life is good, and we have to max out your life, right? That's all it is. There might never be anything after that. We're not sure. And so this industry is on the back of this sort of larger global social culture about what life is and what it isn't. Death then, therefore, becomes an absolute evil, right? To avoid at any cost, and we have movements like transhumanism that try to do that, right? The victory of transhumanism is inevitable. We'll forestall death. And medicine is a social practice which is, which is instantiated within this larger global culture. And so when we think about it as religious communities, about what medicine is for, we have to think about this backdrop, right, which we're speaking to. We're speaking to this backdrop particularly today, right, where almost 80% of individuals in the United States, at least, end up dying in the ICU, right? That's where the last moments are, are spent, hooked up to machines and monitors, right, uh, which are soulless. And some might argue that that individual, too, on that bed has become soulless. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And where we want to go is to this vision, or the vision that was shared by Professor Silmazi of St. Francis of Assisi, right, where you're surrounded by loved ones who are tending to you and thinking about you and thinking about what the ontological reality of what is happening is. So my talk will, will parallel his. I'm going to present some theologies of life, death, and health care, talk about dignity and the good death from an Islamic perspective. I'm going to discuss the ethical, legal duties and moral comportment of the patient or the dying person, in this case, the health care provider, or in this case, the palliative care physician. And I'm going to highlight several applied Islamic biotic stances, not trying to take away from others who might uh, talk about this tomorrow, but related to pain control, terminal sedation, and withdrawing and withholding life support. So let's begin with some theology of what life is, right? Life in the Islamic tradition, uh, I would argue, and would be of instrumental value, right? The Quran, and I'm going to kind of quote through some scripture here throughout my slide set to give you a sense and flavor of this, um, that, you know, the purpose of life in this world is, as the Quran says, that we have not created man and jinn except for worship, uh, you know, and right? that you should worship your Lord until it comes to you certainty, or in this case, that means death. So this point is that, that life is of instrumental value, and some would say it is from God, right, to God. Then what is this life that, what is it we're supposed to do? It's a mata, it's a place of cultivation, right? Uh, of deeds, your record of merit for the afterlife. It is a, a temporary abode, right? Abode. It's uh, in Allah, uh, it creates life and death, or death and life. That creates, that Allah SWT creates death and life to test you in of deeds. So that is what this place is. If that's the case, that life is of instrumental value, it's a journey from God to God, then we need to prepare ourselves with the best toolkit. Right? And that's where health comes in, as we're told in a prophetic statement, that <coughs> that the believer that is strong or has strength is, uh, is better uh, and more beloved to God than the one who is weak. But in both of them, in the twain, there is good. And hasten towards that which is beneficial to you. So this is how scholars analyze, well, this is what the prophet said, that there is a benefit to being stronger. You can think about that term stronger in terms of spiritually. You can also think about that in terms of your bodily uh, strength. Healthcare, therefore, then produces, I mean, healthcare produces health, or generates health, which therefore increases one's capacity for good works. So that is also of instrumental value. They're using this and other, other statements from the Prophet, medicine, medical practice becomes a far the kifaya, and then healthcare seeking becomes a permissible, and in some schools of law, a recommended act, which only becomes obligatory when it's certainly life saving. So this remains within the realm of permissibility. And as I said, I think Ayman's going to speak about that tomorrow, so I won't, I won't give too many details there. But it never, never, or rarely becomes elevated to the status of obligatory for various theological reasons. That's the backdrop to then think about end of life care, right? This part of healthcare that, although it costs a lot, and we think about it a lot, is really temporarily, you know, is a very small proportion of one's life. 
And then you think about palliative care, right? Which is in the larger scope, end-of-life care is a larger body of thinking and a philosophy of, of health and health care. And then in the end, you have palliative medicine. So this is the money slide, actually, and I'll come back to this at the end, that I think when we want to frame palliative care within our Muslim societies, we have the prophetic example of how to do so. And you just take that, that is your, it will become your Ars Moriende, so to speak, for the Muslim, right? And I'll detail that in a few slides, but to get there, I need to walk you through a few things. First, I want to talk about dignity. And end-of-life care or palliative care, dignity is, is a term that is often used, right? And it's used by every side in arguments, right? That one, some say that if you don't have someone hooked up to healthcare, I mean, hooked up to ventilators and machines, you're not treating that individual with dignity. Others say that is the opposite, right? And that palliative care, one of its mantras is that you live, right, with dignity near death. Some talk about dignity as being some sort of right of exercising control over one's manner of death, Right? And that's an argument that's used. Therefore, it's called Death with Dignity Acts that talk about terminal, a physician-assisted suicide. Others just say, throw this term away. It is just a term that's used right, as a cover for religious groups to bring into the conversation to the mainstream. Right? That it holds no other value. It is just that, that, that sort of term. So dignity is a term that you have to know about. And then, therefore, we must think about it when we're talking about Islam and Muslims, what that means for us. And so for me, one of the papers I cite that was very helpful for me thinking about where this, how this term situates itself or how it can be situated within the Muslim tradition is from Dr. Salmaze's Topology of Human Dignity. He did a lot of work to get there, but I just, I'll tell you what, what I understand of it, and he can correct me in the Q&A. But there are three types uh, of dignity that are used. This, this term is used in three different ways. One, and which he talked about in his talk, is intrinsic dignity, right, which is the worth of value that human beings have simply because of the thing that they are, the, the kind of natural thing that they are, the natural kind. It's attributed to all human beings equally, in equal measure, and is not diminished by illness, right? That's intrinsic dignity. Attributed dignity is dignity that's conferred to other individuals, right? So a dignitary comes in, we say someone, right? We're conferring dignity on that individual on the basis of their position, their skills, their virtue, their power. It's a curated value, right? And then you have inflorescent dignity, which is the expression in behaviors, actions, or states of being that demonstrates the highest ideals of one's nature. It's related in that sense to intrinsic dignity, right? That it comes out, this is the most flourishing that one can be and is expressed, and you also see that. That person was very dignified in his comportment when facing death. We use that in our vernacular. So there's another term, another topology of what dignity represents. There are some homeomorphic equivalents, or you can call them conceptual analogs, whichever one you want, uh, within the Muslim tradition for each one of these. Right? So dignity is talked about in terms of two terms that are in my reading, karama and hurma. Right? Dignity as karama is this notion of honor and generosity. Right? It's attributed, attributed in the sense and they're attributed in the heavens, but in this world it becomes sort of intrinsic. That's dignity conferred by God to human beings is a reflection of God's lutf, his grace, and all human beings share equally in this favor of being created by God. And so the verses even talk about by his hand, right? It's intrinsic, as I said, it's because of the kind of thing that they are, the kind of creature God created. The other term that's used is about hurma, and also maps on to human dignity in a sense. That Arabic root is from sacredness or prohibition or inviolability, right? And you'll see this in the scriptural sources that I quote in the next few slides, that it relates to this notion of inviolability of property, of honor, of body, right? But also of functionality. And there, therefore, it's used to talk about the human body being sacred. So here are the scriptural sources backing up that, that both of these terms uh, have a mapping onto drink, into drink, into dignity. So here's the scriptural sources for intrinsic dignity. Right? That, that this, and I'll translate, sorry, I didn't put the translations there. That for every Muslim upon a Muslim, right, they're haram, right? Meaning what? His blood, his, his possessions, and his honor, right? This inviolability belongs to all of this group, this community all members equivalently, and at least to a negative right, right? That you don't kill, take their possessions, and, destroy, and, and dishonor them. That the breaking of the bone of the dead individual is like breaking the bone of the one who is living. Again, the inviolability of this notion of intrinsic dignity 
it extends to the dead state. It's not just the body, it's not just the body when it's ensouled, but rather even after that, that there is some sort of dignity of that body itself as the kind of thing that it is. Right? There's a negative right again of not disrupting that. Or this verse, uh, which, or this uh, hadith here, which Professor Musa mentioned a bit of, uh, the end here says, Right? So the, the beginning starts when you face each other in, in war, right? Don't strike the face of the other combatant. For, that God has created Adam upon his form. And that what that form means is debated, as he mentioned, right? But, but the human form is special. And if you think about this, the way this is, this, the grammar works in this scriptural text, it is related to God again, Adam, right? That he created Adam. So it's again conferred by God upon this form, this shape, this visage potentially of Adam or the son or the, the sons of the children of Adam. Okay, so that's intrinsic, and I map that onto largely hurma. Then you have attributed dignity here. That if a person of a tribe comes to you who is honored, then also honor that individual, and that leads to a positive right. The first slide set was about negative rights. Don't violate, don't hit, don't do this. Now it's what do you do for that person, right? You now also honor the individual coming to you who's known as a honored individual in that community. And this verse here, I won't recite the whole verse for you, but it says near the end here, right, that... Uh, that the one who is most honored to God, right, is the one who is most conscious of God. Meaning that the righteous deeds of individuals elevate oneself in the sight of God, that there are gradations of merit. So while we talked about the idea that intrinsic dignity at one level is equal and shared by individuals, right, because the verse that is attributed to, that, that is derived from, talks about Allah SWT says that I created uh, 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 the children of Adam, right? And that we gave him honor upon the children of Adam. So everybody is a child of Adam who's human being. Therefore, evil, everybody's equidistant from God has the same dignity. But here, there's a notion of attributed dignity. Your deeds elevate you, right? Your righteous deeds elevate you. Your merit making elevates you in a certain sense. So there's both this equivalence, but also a gradation that occurs within the mapping of dignity within the tradition. How does this relate to theological ethics kind of at the end of life? Well, every intervention, every medical intervention can impinge upon either human dignity in the sense of karama, right? Or the inviolability of the human being in terms of hurma. Every intervention. Even just the fact of being in the hospital, right? There are indignities of being in the hospital. And also, uh, that preserving the mere physiological life is not a worthy goal in and of itself. So that also comes from scriptural texts. Again, I believe others will speak about this tomorrow, so I don't want to give too much away about that. But I would just say here, for the purposes to build up this argument I'm getting to, to why the prophet's example is the one that we should think about when framing palliative care, the quality of life is tied to the ability to affect good works. Just take that as, right, that this notion of what his life is for instrumentally relates to merit making in that sense. So how, do this, how does this relate to us thinking about end of life care in terms of the implications of karama and hurma? Well, karama comes from this notion of equid equidistance from God. So you must focus on God's man relationship and illness, the dependency, right? You should think about providing spiritual support. And you should seek to preserve consciousness. And I say that because consciousness is a condition for worship and spiritual practices. If life is of instrumental value to make your uh, station in the afterlife better, then Consciousness is a prerequisite to doing that sort of activity. Hurma, in terms of inviolability, relates to a cautious approach to invasive clinical interventions because you want to preserve that integrity of the body, both while it is inhabited by the soul, also when it is not. Right? So therefore, when it is not, post-mortem examinations are restricted except for certain legal causes. Okay, so we talked about intrinsic, talked about attributed dignity, how they implicate, uh, what the implications are for and end of life care. I'm going to return to the example that I said was the money slide before I go into the next parts of my talk, much, much, uh, much less, I guess, well, much less descriptive in that modality. So let me spend a moment talking about and sharing this story. So I, I can share personal stories, but this is the one that's very important about the final days of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how that relates to our thinking about inflorescent dignity, how to have a good death through his life. 
So there are several instances, and one of them it talks about that he takes his servant with him to the Jannat al-Baqi, to the cemetery of where his companions are buried. And he walks there and he goes there and he's overheard by his servant uh, saying certain things. And one of the things he says, Al-Rafiq al-A'la, Al-Rafiq al-A'la, the higher companion or the highest companion. And then he comes back to his servant who is standing at a distance and he says to him, what would, would you do, and this is paraphrasing, if I told you about an individual who was asked about everlasting life or being with, you know, highest companion. <laughs> and he says, you know, what would you think about that individual? What choice would they make? And there are other generations that talk about different ways he said this. He's actually referring to himself. He was offered a choice of having everlasting life in this world or being with the highest companion, meaning being with God. And he over, the person overhearing him saying, Al-Rafiqa he was choosing to be with God, right? And so this carries on, he becomes ill. Many people talk about types of illnesses he had. He had a headache, he had fevers. And he ends up staying in the, delight, in, the, in the house of one of his beloved wives. And he sees what ends up happening is that uh, people are, are thinking about, can we cure him? Can we give him medicine? At one point, they, they try to put something in his mouth, right, some medicine. He turns away, and then they do it. They give him the medicine. And when he regains consciousness, or when he regains his sort of power, he, he sort of makes them all take that medicine. And he asked his wife, Aisha, whose house he was in, what, what were you doing? He's like, we thought it was, you were turning away just like any patient wants to turn away from medicine. That's what they were assuming. But rather he was rejecting this notion of futile and to say, some would say futile, some would say just medicine in itself, because he had already chosen to be with God, right? That, that medicine, he made everybody else taste that. Near the final moments in the narration, again, in her house, you know, a, a, a companion comes in, who actually ends up being the brother of Aisha, whose house he's in, and he has a siwak, he has a tooth stick in his mouth, and the prophet now is really incapacitated, so he's looking at it, right? And his wife says, or thinks that he wants it, because he used to have a practice of cleaning his teeth. So she takes this, the, the tooth stick, moistens it with her mouth, right, crunches on it, and puts it in his mouth. And the narration we told, this is the last thing, right? She talks about how her saliva and his saliva mixed at the end of life at his last moments, right? And several days before this, I ended up on the slide, he had gone out after getting bathed in water to, the, to, the, to the, the mosque to lead prayer, and he asked people that if you have anything to take of me, take of me now. If you have anything to take of me, if I owe you anything, take of me now, right? And, his, and no one says anything, and a companion gets up at the end to say, I, I have something. And his closest companions get up to try to push the man down or got very upset with the man, and he says, no, no, no. Right? No, 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 let him, this is a time for him to ask. And he says, when I was, you were on a camel, you know, you were trying to strike the camel, and this, this whip that you had hit me. So he turns around and takes off his back and says, now you can hit me with this. Right? The idea being that justice needs to be served in this world. Justice needs to be served in this world. If I owe someone something here, I can't take care of it in the afterlife. I must do it here. So the point of all this is that if you frame Peter care, says, this is the exemplar for us, right? And the goal of care, if you're thinking about the health system, is to maximize merit making, to preserve the cognitive and physical functioning of an individual to that state, that they can discharge these responsibilities if they want, to attend to the God-man relationship and provide spiritual support, counseling as needed, right? To rectify yourself with God. And that is why I mentioned in my comments here that the model of chambers is very different in the Muslim world. They're called Moshadini. They're actually trying to make right, right, just guidance, right, for the individual. Make yourself right with God before you meet your end, which is different than we think about in the United States, right? Um, the ethical guidelines for, based on Hormah and Karama here, the balance, harm, and benefit of the proposed interventions. And then we really need cultural interventions. This is what we're, in every part of our life, we're told, follow the prophet, how he prayed, right, what he did. But we've forgotten how he approached that end. Right? We need, this is our contemporary Ars Marienda. And how do we do that in our Muslim sort of cultural society? And these are some interventions that occur in different places. So there are death cafes in the United States, right? You get together over coffee to talk about death. We share a lot of coffee here, huh? Ahwa. Well, why don't we talk about uh, the thing that we're told that you should make a lot of mention of the thing that will the, the destroyer of pleasures 
We should do that. Let's have dinner over it, right? People actually sit together, make elegant dinners, they have conversations about death so that their family knows what their preferences are. We're talking about families making decisions for us. How can we haven't told our parents, children, fathers, sons about what our preferences are, how we want to approach death, what they should do, who they should talk to, right? I, myself, the initial Islam medicine is here, this is the other thing. Right? We have workshops and mosques where we talk about the ethical rulings around brain death and end-of-life care, what you're thinking about. Again, to give people some touch points to think about before they're in that state. And we know we have must just funeral management workshops, right? How do you bury, what's the wash? What's the, how do you wash what those things are? But they often neglect the ethical ideas. So this is the source of cultural interventions we need. And we actually test them to see if they work, right? There is a, uh, a, a methodology, scientific methodology, to test whether these interventions improve knowledge, understanding, and, and, and their experience of end-of-life care. So now I'm going to transition. Just, I want to foreshadow some things I believe tomorrow some individuals will talk about. I spent a lot of time right now in terms of Islamic bioethics, right? I think about it as different sort of genres coming together. The inputs from the Islamic side would be Islamic law, theology, and ethics. I talked about theology for a moment. Let me touch upon ethics before I end with Islamic law. So you'll find this uh, interesting, uh, uh, Professor Salmezi. I don't know if I shared this with you before, but there is a tradition, one of the highest traditions, Hadith Qudsi, about the, uh, the God is sort of the prophets talking about God and what God's saying near the end of time, and in this case, in the day of judgment, talking to one of the peop- uh, one of the uh, one of his creation, and he says that you know I was ill, but you did not visit me, and the individual says, well, you're the Lord of the worlds. How could I visit you? Well, if you went to so-and-so who was sick, you would have found me with him, right? That this notion becomes, feel, uh, funds a, a duty to visit the sick. And now this is my foreshadowing for Professor Musa. I didn't plan all this. I'm also Akbari in a certain sense, right? We think about the interaction between the patient and the provider as actually just interaction between the names of God. That would be an Ibn Arabi sort of notion, right? That we're all just reflections of the attributes of God between Al-Mumit, right, the one who who takes away life, and Al-Hayy, the one who gives life. In that interaction between those two names of God is all of healthcare. And if you think about that, that's all that's happening. You're seeing God, you're acting as an attribute of God, or if you want to be not an Akbar, you can say with Shafi, right? I'm acting out the one who cures as a physician. That is the theological notion that leads to certain types of adab, practices that we need to cultivate in, in being a dying person, or being the one who's tending to a dying person. This adab with God, right? That's the, that's the highest and most important thing. How do you relate to God? What is the comportment you have towards Him? So I'm not going to go through all these texts. I mean, the, recite all the texts here. I just have them in case you want to know where they came from. But the notion is, right, that the fiction and relief from affliction, right, unto Allah da'wah diwa, is from God. That that's what's happening in the healthcare encounter. So the dying person should be thinking about that. That my affliction is from God and my cure will be from God, and that is who I need to resolve myself, or attach myself to. That you need to have a good opinion of God, right? That I am in the opinion that my servant has of me. And that none of you believe until you have a good opinion of God. The point being that you should have that good opinion. That's ultimately what you're desirous of. Having a good comportment in front of God. The healthcare provider is just a means for it. But there are limits. And this I will sort of recite the Arabic because I think it's important. The companions who got sick, they even asked him, well, can I ask for death? This is too much for me. This life or trial or tribulation is too much for me. Different narrations come about whether it's a stomach ailment, other people said things. He gives him this prayer. Allahumma ahini ma kanat hayati khayra li wa dafani idha kanat wa fata khayra li that you can't ask for death, but if it comes to you at this point, then you should say, oh God, bring to me, give to me life, or keep me alive, so long as there is goodness in it for me. And bring to me death, if there is goodness in it. Death is not the ultimate evil. There can be goodness in death. And that is the most that you can ask. You can't ask for death, but you make this prayer. Right? Again, life of instrumental value. Important here, both life and death are of the same instrumental value in the wording of this prayer. Each of them right, can bring about good. Uh, limits uh, in terms of dying person, as I mentioned, was you can't ask for death, but also that you can't partake of impure, impure substances. So we'll leave that for a moment. I know I'm running out of time. 
the provider. What's, again, the most important relationship is that component towards God. So you have to recognize that you're but an instrument. Again, that God is the one who heals. He's the one who sends out illness and cure. You have to strive to deliver the best care, right? We know this hadith, in Allah ala Interesting, that hadith, is, that, ver, that saying is the beginning of a hadith about destruction, about killing or sacrificing an animal. That even in this notion of destruction, you should have ihsan, excellence in what you're doing. And then you give comfort and hope. Again, I wanted to draw a parallel to what Professor Samezi was talking about. That, you know, when one of you visits the ill, then reassure him regarding his lifespan, right? Indeed, that won't change anything, but it will bring comfort to his soul. That we should be thinking about hope, not that you will get cured, but you give hope and glad tidings to the individual. The limits of this, right, is that all of us physicians to think about the end of this hadith, that fohal dhaman, that we are all liable and responsible for what we do. If we don't know, if we act outside of our expertise, we'll be called into account on the day of judgment. And then this, do not take life, right? I started with this hadith, that this hurma of life, that you can't take life. This is made inviolable by God. So finally, Right, I think the counsel for providers should be that we should build up the influence of dignity at the end of life through spiritual support, counsel to set right the affairs of this world. Have people, people should have a good opinion of God. Now, whether I ask this question for those providers here, whether that is the responsibility of physicians or of an institutional religious leader in the hospital, that is for you to figure out, but I think that must be done. We should respect and acknowledge human dignity. Illness does not lessen the intrinsic dignity in this case, and what I'm talking about is the attributed dignity, uh, the attributed by God dignity in Islam. Ending a life does threatens this value, and we should limit indignities and care. Finally, right, as scholars gaze upon biomedicine, I want to just share a few things. So we know what ends up happening is that oftentimes a legal scholar is asked by a physician, can I do something? What's Islamic hukum on this or that? They think about the Quran and Sunnah and the maqas and the qulai, then they come up with some legal ruling. Now this oftentimes I want to share with you that physicians are also disquieted by this juncture in healthcare, this area, right? So I did a national survey of Muslim physicians in the United States. We found that they found withdrawing and withholding of life support to be challenging. 79% found it more ethically problematic to withdraw than to withhold life supporting, uh, life sustaining treatment, right? And this is an experience, and I agree with Dan that, that that is much more troubling. I think that also relates to how we think about it in the Islamic legal sense. If that's what people experience, there is some input for that, how we think about it as a legal category. Interestingly, 18% disagreed that compliance with the competent patient Swiss oh, request to withdraw life support was mandatory. This is down in teaching in the United States. Uh, individuals didn't feel this way. And 46% did not view brain death as equal to death. There is disquietude amongst the Muslim physician population in the United States. I'm sure in other places as well, this will hold true. In terms of withdrawing and withholding life support, you know, Mehrouin's in this room, she and I and others, we did this review of what the FIT Council say about this, and I want to give you the, 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 the money slide there, that two broad guidelines uh, are seen when you look at all the fatah around withdrawing and withholding life support. And these guidelines are that you can withdraw or withhold when the clinical state of a patient is such that medical care is futile. Again, paralleling what, what Dan said, harms, you right, outweigh the benefits. And also, when individuals have brain dead physiology, that the obligation to initiate a community life support ceases to exist. Some would argue this is not death. Some would say it is legal death. Some would say it's a dying state. But it doesn't matter. Both camps allow for the withdrawal of life support. Um, fine, uh, now I'm really ending. So about pain control, because was mentioned again today, you know, pain, I, I would believe, and I find it really problematic when we think about pain as equating to suffering, there is some benefit theologically to suffering or pain in this world. Um, the prophet talks about expiation for sins and many other things. So I don't think pain equates with suffering, but it is a harm in legal, uh, as a legal category, and it's subjective. Um, loss of conscience and control is to be avoided when you do give pain control. This is because of the notion of, of preservation of, of intellect, and again, because you need to have intellect and consciousness to perform religious duties. And it must be proportionate and titrated to patients' needs, right? Um, if you, as an empirical person, we have to think about what is most appropriate for a society or for an individual. Some people can tolerate can opiates work for them, some people it doesn't. And we're talking about marijuana now for various things, right? So you have to think about what it is and what the data behind that is. As far as terminal sedation, it falls from the above that you can't kill, right? So it's not permitted as the end goal. Ending existential crises and all these things is not one that is considered legitimate from an Islamic ethical legal perspective. 
So um, this is where we're at in the hospital. We want to get away from that. We want to have a more community-based palliative care. I agree with that notion. Um, I don't think we want euthanasia coasters, which is what some people say we should, we can do, that we can actually create this as a thesis by an individual, forget in which country in Europe, where he calculated what height a roller coaster needed to be. And I know these Arabs are about building high buildings, but this was like, if you go on this roller coaster, by the time you end, you'll become, have brain death physiology. So you die out, you die, right, on a roller coaster. Um, I don't think we want to do that, um, and I hope I haven't confused you too much with that, I'll end. A question, and it's related. In our daily practice in palliative care units, uh, one of the most challenges uh, discussion that will be with the family members, it's the DNR discussion. And when we will come in that discussion, the family members usually they will come uh, with Quran, ayat, and they will say, Man and also, sometimes they will say, Yahya al wa huwa ramima, wa hiya ramima. So usually, when we are facing these difficult conversations, sometimes it's very challenges. Uh, like, you know, it will be challengeable for us to just convince them that this is uh, their loved one uh, with uh, cancer. He's going to die or she's going to die. And at this stage, the best is, uh, like, you know, to withdraw all the support, and they will go for DNR. But usually, what we need to say to them, that's all these advancement in, uh, in health, actually, technology and the ventilator and the support that uh, we have now, it was not supported. Like, you know, we, we need to just tell them to go back to Prophet Muhammad and how uh, death was accepted for him. and. It, Allowing natural death was there. So usually, what is your recommendation in this situation? And how we can convince the family member that this is the best choice of care? So um, I think this is a question, it's a very important question, and I'm going to uh, suggest a few things. One, um, I'm not sure that your role is to convince anybody anything. So the take, and this is my personal take, right, studying Islamic ethics and thinking about being a physician, being an ethics consultant, um, that I think that we need to give people information, upon, uh, true information upon which they can act. And so my role is not to persuade necessarily an individual unless I know them and I know their value system and I'm having a conversation at that level where they can understand that I'm advising them as, their, as a moral guide who's very close to them. But if I'm a physician who's seen them for a few times, right, or if I'm a consultant, my role is to give them information and factual information. So for example, as you said, people can, we have you know, various ayat about various things, but we know that our system of ethics doesn't just look at one verse, right? Uh, that law isn't verse-based, right? There's precedent, uh, there's legal rulings, there's schools of law, there's a theory to apply, there's differences of opinion. Right, and so one of the things we teach, and right here are the here are the canonical four Sunni schools of how they talk about the obligation to seek medical treatment. Here are the different views within the schools. Here's what it is, and those who are going to engage in that conversation first themselves must know what the bases are, right, and what the rulings are, and they say here's what it is, and here are the citations. You can go discuss that with your religious scholar, but I think you're misunderstanding potentially this verse or that verse, right? But the point is only your information giving. I don't feel you should persuade them necessarily about their belief because in the end, they're the ones who are mukallaf, right? They have to choose. And in this case, if they're making a decision for someone else, they're the wali of the other individual. So that's, that's my advice to you about, right? Yes, it's very difficult. And I think it's difficult because one, we don't have a, um, a cultural memory of these sorts of interventions, right, particularly in this part of the world, potentially, uh, for generations, right? People haven't, seen, and then now when it's in the hospital, people feel that they don't have power to make decisions. Someone else is controlling, so there's a gut reaction to kind of continue on. So you give them power by giving them knowledge, and here are the choices, here's the data, here's the medical aspects, here are those aspects, and you come back to us to make a decision. And we also have to arm ourselves. I think physicians, um, I don't know where in your medical training you learned sort of Islamic ethics or law. If you did, you're one of the few who did. But we don't, right? We cater to a lot of Muslim patients. A lot of Muslim patients think we know something about our faith tradition. I would say by and large, and my research shows that we know very little. And we actually malpractice in religious ethics often. So I think that the onus is upon us. If we're going to do that sort of persuasion or information giving, we must start learning. And I have courses for that. Right? And then have cultural interventions, have conversations about death. There are actually, I was on a, um, 
I was on a, a plane and I was watching some Malaysian, I don't know, uh, um, a drama or something. They actually have conversations about death on these, right? And how you approach death within this sort of drama narrative. I don't know if that sort of interventions exist here. That people understand organ donation, death, right? In comic books, there are organ donation conversations. Do we have this sort of cultural interventions, educational interventions within our community so that the next generation can grow up thinking about these things in a much, nuanced, much more nuanced way? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I would differ slightly perhaps uh, from uh, Dr. Padella um, in the sense that um, I think we have an obligation to do more than just give information. Um, that um, we can abandon people to their autonomy um, if we allow them uh, only to make in, you know, if, if we put all the responsibility for making the decisions on their shoulders um, and just give them information as if we were reading um, a menu to them in a, in a restaurant. We, um, for the first 2,500 years of Western medicine, we couldn't do anything but give people opinions. <laughs> we couldn't affect the outcome at all. We could sort of say your child is going to live, your child is going to die, and, and give them an opinion. And I, I think we need to continue to give opinions um, based on our expertise and sort of say, here's what I think would be best given what um, I know about medicine given the hundreds of people that I've cared for who are in similar situations. Where I think we'd be in agreement is I don't think it's your job if they refuse that to sort of engage in um, a theological argument and interpret their religion for them. I mean, that's up, up to them. But I think that we do need to give an opinion um, and they can refuse it, but, but it's part of our duty, I think, to give them an opinion. Yeah, it was more an observation, really. I, I sort of, it was to Dr. Padella, I really agree that we should um, make our conversations about death, end of life, less muffled. And I come from England, where I think, you know, culturally, I've lived in a lot of different countries, it's very muffled. You know, pe people don't in the workplace, people return after serious bereavements and are very uncomfortable going up to a colleague and, you know, offering condolences. It's, it's very, very, you know, it's, I, I would like to see that more. I guess, I guess the, the, the question is, I wondered whether the interventions you're suggesting, the whole kind of death cafes, you know, talking about death at dinner parties, of course you can approach it that way. I wondered if that was quite, quite an American kind of way of approaching things in a really explicit way, because to a certain extent, you know, narrative, or, and I was glad to hear you mention Malaysian dramas, narrative or fiction might be in some ways, I think, an even more effective remedy for being able to confront something that is just so frightening, you know, in terms of the human condition. Um, come back to the DNR issue. Um, and I agree with you that we face this quite a lot. And, and I know when we are developing the DNR policy, and I think maybe we could have wished to have a, a session on the DNR itself, or maybe tomorrow, end of life uh, uh, discussion. But we, we, we face this all the time. And we really have to give a little bit more firm opinion rather than putting them just the fact for them. Because uh, so I know of two styles when initially we were consenting the family that they um, that they should sign the f because you have you are dealing with an, an, an acute leukemia patient whom you know you have exhausted all and you could take her to ICU and take her for seven eight nine ten days of ventilator but you know that th that is the that is the ten days but that ten days could be used effectively by another patient uh, who is uh, salvageable. And, and so you could say to the family, um, we are not going to put our, uh, we are not going to resuscitate and, and put compression of, on the chest. And uh, that, that decision is taken. And, and in some institution, they require two consultants to sign rather than, um, rather than the family. And if they are independently have agreed that that's what should be done, then that's done. So I think that that's where the, I wanted to say that we really, some have to put a more clear statement on what we are. And then the other, other is the, the Christian approach to 
I told you I, I lived in, in Dublin, and uh, the, <laughs> invariably at death, or not not death, but somebody they called for a resuscitation. And uh, the, invariably, the first person to arrive is the priest who is in, in and, and do the, do whatever prayer or whatever <laughs> that, that I don't understand. And I, when I'm dictating, say, like sending doctors death um, uh, announcement that I'm, I say, rest in peace or whatever. So, that is that was the, that we were doing this all the time in 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 Ireland. But then when I went to the United States, the f the first thing I did I did the same, and people just call me back and say, "Where did you get this from? What? Why are you doing this?" And not in the sense that they don't want me to do, but they were surprised because that that nobody else is doing. So, you know, you understand what I'm. <laughs> so. I don't know whether there are differences or in 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 the in the conceptualization of of um, of what happened after death and and so on. We're talking about palliative care, which is part and parcel of our philosophy or theology of medical care. Way before we're talking about DNR, the end of life, right? I mean, when you've diagnosed a life-limiting illness, or you can even say it should even start before then. So when you're talking about DNR, and when I'm gonna make this version of DNR, you're, and, and the way you even said it, you see the framing is, I'm thinking about equity issues, about whether it's gonna be beneficial for this person to you know, push on their chest. People talk about, oh, we wanna prevent this pain. I need that bed for someone else. But I'm not talking about all those other things, I'm thinking, right? Because the, 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 the crunching of the ribs, I'm an ER doctor, is it stressful for the people who are doing it? Right, the bed not being there is problematic for the next person who needs that bed. I'm talking about this individual themselves when they're eight months ago in that state of terminal cancer, stage four, why don't you have a conversation about what your goals of care are? Why don't you talk about that at that point? So, so what I'm saying is that's a symptom of the fact that we've forgotten how to talk about death and the care provision of our patients. And if you, and I'm an ER doctor, so some of my views of this are colored, because I don't have long-term relationships with patients, really. I am the one who, you know, 35, 40% of my patients don't have nothing. And I'm the one who has to then think about, do I, can I, do I, can I say I don't want to start resuscitation with my residents around me? This person has, you know, is, has stage four lung disease, I mean, uh, stage four cancer, lung cancer, because I'm dealing with the fact that no one had the conversation with them when they were diagnosed or even before that when they were started you know, seeing a geriatrician. So that's why my perspective is that, that like, okay, that DNR conversation is one that is a failure at the end when you're talking about how to convince someone to sign DNR, because they should understand the philosophy and the trajectory of their illness way before that. You understand? And, that's, and, and that point, I, I would agree in this sense, that I think that you're all right, that doctors should be giving advice, right? But, um, I, I think that that should occur before. And my perspective might be, okay, well, I'm gonna give them information because I'm dealing with ER, withdrawal life support now in the ED before they go to the ICU. And I'm having those sorts of conversations. And those conversations, I don't feel very comfortable with someone I'm just seeing for the first time who's just suffered, a, right? They don't, maybe it's unanticipated because they had a car accident and a brain bleed. And having those conversations about, here's what I think you should do, because then I'll be the big back doctor who withdrew life support upon their family. Yeah. Yes, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd also agree that the, uh, we can sometimes make too much of the do not resuscitate order, and language, at least in the United States, has begun to change toward more advanced care planning, where that's only one small part of the picture. Um, the real conversation ought to be about what's the best thing to do for you now, or set of plans, um, and how do we best treat you, and what's um, most important at this point? Is it pain control, is it being able to be with loved ones, et cetera? Um, um, but, um, does, does chemotherapy still have a role for you? Would being on a ventilator have any role? Those kinds of, of things as part of a wider plan of care for the patient. And, and again, as Awesome had said, to have those up conversations take care, uh, take place upstream, right before the, uh, the final moments. Let me say, though, too, that going back to the language of the Catholic tradition, if the two criteria, right, are futility and whether it's more burdensome than beneficial, 
that the judgment that something is futile is basically a physician's um, decision, right? We decide whether, to a reasonable degree of medical certitude, cardiopulmonary resuscitation is not going to work in this circumstance. There, the patient is not going to make it out of the hospital alive. And then, I'm not sure we even have to offer cardiopulmonary resuscitation is not part of the uh, of what is reasonable for the patient at that point. And so asking the patient um, for permission under those kinds of circumstances is very different from one in which we think it could work, um, but we don't want to make a futility judgment about the person's quality of life, right? Uh, we want the, that, in that case, we may offer an opinion, but ultimately defer to the family for the judgments of what's more burdensome than beneficial, um, if it comes to that, um, and we should have had the conversation earlier. Um, with regard to your second question, um, you know, any religion is going to be culturally instantiated, right? So um, uh, while um, uh, the um, uh, the Irish might have the priest going to the uh, to uh, visit the patient before the CPR team gets there. Um, that's less common in the United States, although I have to say in um, many Catholic hospitals where I've been, that's still part of the, uh, the culture. And the um, at, uh, at uh, Georgetown, at St. Vincent's Hospital in Manhattan, um, the chaplain is also carrying the code beeper, and they will go. And largely what they're doing is, um, is actually supporting the family. Uh, during that time. I mean, they're providing pastoral care to the family, um, 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 which is very, uh, very important in, uh, in those circumstances. I think we're... I just wanted to comment on um, uh, how we work here in Qatar. Uh, so we ha DNAR is a medical decision. And when we discuss with family, actually, we tell them that this is our decision and it's based on the patient condition. And actually, it gets easier if we know the patient or we, we have something called early introduction to palliative care. So if we know the patient and the family, it's easier because we, we don't discuss DNR on the last, uh, or before death. We have this discussion um, since diagnosis, especially some, you know, um, cancer diagnosis or palliative from diagnosis. If we have that, it's much easier. We have all some, uh, as you said, or, or actually maybe you said you discussed death on the, uh, with your family, but here not everybody practice that. So uh, sometimes patients tell us that they don't want to, to have uh, aggressive intervention. They doesn't tell to their pay, uh, family. So we have to document that and I, we have to discuss it among the team. So the team knows what to do then. Um, also, when we talk about DNAR and restation, we tell them that um, chest compression, ventilation actually prolongs suffering. So it's a point that really help us um, or help them make decision. Prolonged suffering is something that family doesn't want uh, really to. And, um, uh, palliative care, end of life, and DNAR all are new concepts in the region. So it's really difficult. I think we are making progress, but still, Needs more time. Um, thank you both. Um, really, really powerful presentations. I'm going to um, shift the conversation a little bit and, and take it back to what, what you were um, telling us about, uh, Prof. Salmezi, in terms of virtues. Um, when we think about end of life care, it's an aspect of healthcare ethics that's often neglected. We usually think about ends or we think about duties, rarely virtues. And when you were describing virtues, you know, particularly around hope, um, and the description you provided was, was, was very, very important. What, what I wanted to do was um, add a little bit to that in terms of what the Islamic perspective is, which is for a lot of patients and families um, that we encounter either in the clinical setting or the research set setting, often their conception of hope is tied to a reliance on God that is linked to a hope for cure. Um, and when they present this theological commitment in the healthcare setting, what they're struggling with is a balance of two virtues, the acceptance in God's will, or um, what, what um, 
uh, Prof Musa described this morning as, you know, Jalal, you know, the God's um, qualities of might, and balancing it with with hope or the the merciful aspects of, of of God. So, how do we think about these coexisting virtues of hope and acceptance? And is there a conversation that needs to be had about there being situations where two goods can't coexist that we need to also think about giving up one good in order to uphold another? Well, I, you know, I, I think in the end, prudence is the master virtue that um, sort of helps to delineate, um, you know, in that sort of a situation which dominates, right? Um, and we can't be perfect at that, um, but um, um, there um, will be a, there will be a time when you know, so we all have a sort of natural hope to be able to live, right? Um, and we have to have um, the, the wisdom to be able to see the point at which such hopes are actually false, right? Um, um, at least in this world, and that we can um, um, bring ourselves to the point of having the, um, the uh, ultimate hope that we have to have in, um, in God. Um, there is, as um, you know, Aristotle um, would, would say, no um, um, a formula for this, right? There is a rule of Lesbos that bends around, so that we have to pay attention to the um, uh, to the particulars of the situation and understand in a particular situation which is right. But um, but I think it is not an unresolvable dilemma. It's difficult, um, uh, but that it's practical wisdom that helps us to discern what's the point at which we um, give up our natural hope for survival and. Um, our prayers to God for survival, and recognize that um, um, that actually those are passing, um, but that the supernatural hope, the hope for um, uh, salvation, the hope for life with God, um, is um, is the virtue that we need to cultivate at that point. And then, Christian tradition, we would say, um, uh, surrender. Um, perhaps um, in the uh, Islamic tradition, submit to the will of God under those circumstances. So, so I, I I think that Professor Mazi gave a good synopsis. I think that the only thing I'll add is that we have to hold, and our tradition is very good at this, at least the Sunni tradition, that we hold things in tension. Right? You have free will, but there's faith. Huh? You have the golden handshake. All four madhahib are fine. But one is maybe more. Or there is a hukum. There isn't a hukum. I don't know. Right? Um, that we are very sophisticated and capable of holding many things in tension at the same time. And that hope is, if you think about the human being as, as having multiple parts, right? Well, is that healing? The, the, the hadith talks about every disease has a, right, has a cure. Allah sends down his healing. Is that healing a psychological, spiritual? Is it a physical healing? What is it, right? Is that hope in, uh, you know, in, 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 in resolution, right? So I, I'll claim to be maltoridi in this sense, right? Yeah, the wisdom of God will be discerned at the day of judgment, that's the hope that you have. You'll understand why you were right in travails at this point. So I think that we uh, we want to be very um, simplistic for practical purposes, but actually having this sort of uh, more nuanced and sophisticated uh, traditions allows us to sort of put uh, allows us to give options to people put themselves where you want to be on that spectrum. Right? You have many choices here. There are many ways to resolve intention. Have hope and hope and how you're thinking about that hope. There's many different ways to think about it. Then, well, it's either you're going to be cured or you're going to die or whatever else it might be. So that's, that's all I'll add um, that, that we have to think about in the afterlife uh, uh, ramification and hold things in tension. One, one quick um, sort of practical way of uh, holding, holding both in uh, intention, maybe too practical, is to say hope for the best but prepare for the worst. <laughs> <laughs>